the waves. The sun had not yet risen. The sea was indistinguishable from the sky, except that the sea was slightly creased as if a cloth had wrinkles in it. Gradually as the sky whitened a dark line lay on the horizon dividing the sea from the sky and the grey cloth became barred with thick strokes moving, one after another, beneath the surface, following each other, pursuing each other, perpetually. As they neared the shore each bar rose, heaped itself, broke and swept a thin veil of white water across the sand. The wave paused, and then drew out again, sighing like a sleeper whose breath comes and goes unconsciously. Gradually the dark bar on the horizon became clear as if the sediment in an old wine bottle had sunk and left the glass green. Behind it, too, the sky cleared as if the white sediment there had sunk, or as if the arm of a woman couched beneath the horizon had raised a lamp and flat bars of white, green, and yellow spread across the sky like the blades of a fan. Then she raised her lamp higher and the air seemed to become fibrous and to tear away from the green surface flickering and flaming in red and yellow fibers like the smoky fire that roars from a bonfire. Gradually the fibers of the burning bonfire were fused into one haze, one incandescence which lifted the weight of the woolen grey sky on top of it and turned it to a million atoms of soft blue. The surface of the sea slowly became transparent and lay rippling and sparkling until the dark stripes were almost rubbed out. Slowly the arm that held the lamp raised it higher and then higher until a broad flame became visible, an arc of fire burnt on the rim of the horizon, and all round it the sea blazed gold. The light struck upon the trees in the garden, making one leaf transparent and then another. One bird chirped high up, there was a pause another chirped lower down. The sun sharpened the walls of the house, and rested like the tip of a fan upon a white blind and made a blue fingerprint of shadow under the leaf by the bedroom window. The blind stirred slightly, but all within was dim and unsubstantial. The birds sang their blank melody outside. I see a ring, said Bernard, hanging above me. It quivers and hangs in a loop of light. I see a slab of pale yellow, said Susan, spreading away until it meets a purple stripe. I hear a sound, said Rhoda, cheep, chirp, cheep chirp, going up and down. I see a globe, said Neville, hanging down in a drop against the enormous flanks of some hill. I see a crimson tassel, said Ginny, twisted with gold threads. I hear something stamping, said Louis. A great beast's foot is chained. It stamps, and stamps, and stamps. Look at the spider's web on the corner of the balcony, said Bernard. It has beads of water on it, drops of white light. The leaves are gathered round the window like pointed ears, said Susan. A shadow falls on the path, said Louis like an elbow bent. Islands of light are swimming on the grass, said Rhoda. They have fallen through the trees. The bird's eyes are bright in the tunnels between the leaves, said Neville. The stalks are covered with harsh, short hairs, said Ginny, and drops of water have stuck to them. A caterpillar is curled in a green ring, said Susan, notched with blunt feet. The grey-shelled snail draws across the path and flattens the blades behind him, said Rhoda. And burning lights from the window panes flash in and out on the grasses, said Louis. Stones are cold to my feet, said Neville. I feel each one, round or pointed, separately. The back of my hand burns, said Ginny, but the palm is clammy and damp with dew. Now the cock crows like a spurt of hard, red water in the white tide, said Bernard. Birds are singing up and down and in and out all round us, said Susan. The beast stamps, the elephant with its foot chained, the great brute on the beach stamps, said Louis. Look at the house, said Ginny, with all its windows white with blinds. Cold water begins to run from the scullery tap, said Rhoda, 
over the mackerel in the bowl. The walls are cracked with gold cracks, said Bernard, and there are blue, finger-shaped shadows of leaves beneath the windows. Now Mrs. Constable pulls up her thick black stockings, said Susan. When the smoke rises, sleep curls off the roof like a mist, said Louis. The birds sang in chorus first, said Rhoda. Now the scullery door is unbarred. Off they fly. Off they fly like a fling of seed. But one sings by the bedroom window alone. Bubbles form on the floor of the saucepan, said Ginny. Then they rise, quicker and quicker, in a silver chain to the top. Now Billy scrapes the fish scales with a jagged knife onto a wooden board, said Neville. The dining room window is dark blue now, said Bernard, and the air ripples above the chimneys. A swallow is perched on the lightning conductor, said Susan. And Biddy has smacked down the bucket on the kitchen flags. That is the first stroke of the church bell, said Louis. Then the others follow, one, two, one, two, one, two. Look at the tablecloth, flying white along the table, said Rhoda. Now there are rounds of white china, and silver streaks beside each plate. Suddenly a bee booms in my ear, said Neville. It is here, it is past. I burn, I shiver, said Ginny, out of this sun into this shadow. Now they have all gone, said Louis. I am alone. They have gone into the house for breakfast, and I am left standing by the wall among the flowers. It is very early, before lessons. Flower after flower is specked on the depths of green. The petals are harlequins. Stalks rise from the black hollows beneath. The flowers swim like fish made of light upon the dark, green waters. I hold a stalk in my hand. I am the stalk. My roots go down to the depths of the world, through earth dry with brick, and damp earth, through veins of lead and silver. I am all fiber. All tremors shake me, and the weight of the earth is pressed to my ribs. Up here my eyes are green leaves, unseeing. I am a boy in gray flannels with a belt fastened by a brass snake up here. Down there my eyes are the lidless eyes of a stone figure in a desert by the Nile. I see women passing with red pitchers to the river, I see camels swaying and men in turbans. I hear tramplings, tremblings, stirrings round me. Up here Bernard, Neville, Ginny and Susan, but not Rhoda, skim the flower beds with their nets. They skim the butterflies from the nodding tops of the flowers. They brush the surface of the world. Their nets are full of fluttering wings. Louis! 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 They shout. But they cannot see me. I am on the other side of the hedge. There are only little eye holes among the leaves. O oh Lord, let them pass. Lord, let them lay their butterflies on a pocket handkerchief on the gravel. Let them count out their tortoise shells their red admirals and cabbage whites. But let me be unseen. I am green as a yew tree in the shade of the hedge. My hair is made of leaves. I am rooted to the middle of the earth. My body is a stalk. I press the stalk. A drop eases from the hole at the mouth and slowly, thickly, grows larger and larger. Now something pink passes the eye hole. Now an eye beam is slid through the chink. Its beam strikes me. I am a boy in a grey flannel suit. She has found me. I am struck on the nape of the neck. She has kissed me. All is shattered. I was running, said Ginny, after breakfast. I saw leaves moving in a hole in the hedge. I thought that is a bird on its nest. I parted them and looked, but there was no bird on a nest. The leaves went on moving. I was frightened. I ran past Susan, past Rhoda, and Neville and Bernard in the tool house talking. I cried as I ran, 
faster and faster. What moved the leaves? What moves my heart, my legs? And I dashed in here, seeing you green as a bush, like a branch, very still, Louis, with your eyes fixed. Is he dead? I thought, and kissed you, with my heart jumping under my pink frock like the leaves, which go on moving, though there is nothing to move them. Now I smell geraniums, I smell earth mold. I dance. I ripple. I am thrown over you like a net of light. I lie quivering flung over you. Through the chink in the hedge, said Susan, I saw her kiss him. I raised my head from my flower pot and looked through a chink in the hedge. I saw her kiss him. I saw them, Ginny and Louis, kissing. Now I will wrap my agony inside my pocket handkerchief. It shall be screwed tight into a ball. I will go to the beech wood alone, before lessons. I will not sit at a table, doing sums. I will not sit next Ginny and next Louis. I will take my anguish and lay it upon the roots under the beech trees. I will examine it and take it between my fingers. They will not find me. I shall eat nuts and peer for eggs through the brambles and my hair will be matted and I shall sleep under hedges and drink water from ditches and die there. Susan has passed us, said Bernard. She has passed the tall house door with her handkerchief screwed into a ball. She was not crying, but her eyes, which are so beautiful, were narrow as cats' eyes before they spring. I shall follow her, Neville. I shall go gently behind her, to be at hand, with my curiosity, to comfort her when she bursts out in a rage and thinks, I am alone. Now she walks across the field with a swing, nonchalantly, to deceive us. Then she comes to the dip, she thinks she is unseen, she begins to run with her fists clenched in front of her. Her nails meet in the ball of her pocket handkerchief. She is making for the beech woods out of the light. She spreads her arms as she comes to them and takes to the shade like a swimmer. But she is blind after the light and trips and flings herself down on the roots under the trees, where the light seems to pant in and out, in and out. The branches heave up and down. There is agitation and trouble here. There is gloom. The light is fitful. There is anguish here. The roots make a skeleton on the ground, with dead leaves heaped in the angles. Susan has spread her anguish out. Her pocket handkerchief is laid on the roots of the beech trees and she sobs, sitting crumpled where she has fallen. I saw her kiss him, said Susan. I looked between the leaves and saw her. She danced in flecked with diamonds light as dust. And I am squat, Bernard, I am short. I have eyes that look close to the ground and see insects in the grass. The yellow warmth in my side turned to stone when I saw Ginny kiss Louis. I shall eat grass and die in a ditch in the brown water where dead leaves have rotted. I saw you go, said Bernard. As you passed the door of the tall house I heard you cry I am unhappy. I put down my knife. I was making boats out of firewood with Neville. And my hair is untidy, because when Mrs. Constable told me to brush it there was a fly in a web, and I asked, shall I free the fly? Shall I let the fly be eaten? So I am late always. My hair is unbrushed and these chips of wood stick in it. When I heard you cry I followed you, and saw you put down your handkerchief, screwed up, with its rage, with its hate, knotted in it. But soon that will cease. Our bodies are close now. You hear me breathe. You see the beetle too carrying off a leaf on its back. It runs this way, then that way, so that even your desire while you watch the beetle, to possess one single thing, it is Louis now, must waver, like the light in and out of the beech leaves, and then words, moving darkly, in the depths of your mind will break up this knot of hardness, screwed in your pocket handkerchief. I love, said Susan, and I hate. I desire one thing only. My eyes are hard. Ginny's eyes break into a thousand lights. Rhodas are like those pale flowers to which moths come in the evening. Yours grow full and brim and never break. 
but I am already set on my pursuit. I see insects in the grass. Though my mother still knits white socks for me and hems pinafores and I am a child, I love and I hate. But when we sit together, close, said Bernard, we melt into each other with phrases. We are edged with mist. We make an unsubstantial territory. I see the beetle, said Susan. It is black, I see, it is green, I see, I am tied down with single words. But you wander off, you slip away, you rise up higher, with words and words in phrases. Now, said Bernard, let us explore. There is the White House lying among the trees. It lies down there ever so far beneath us. We shall sink like swimmers just touching the ground with the tips of their toes. We shall sink through the green air of the leaves, Susan. We sink as we run. The waves close over us, the beach leaves meet above our heads. There is the stable clock with its gilt hands shining. Those are the flats and heights of the roofs of the great house. There is the stable boy cluttering in the yard in rubber boots. That is Elverdon. Now we have fallen through the treetops to the earth. The air no longer rolls its long, unhappy, purple waves over us. We touch earth, we tread ground. That is the close-clipped hedge of the lady's garden. There they walk at noon, with scissors, clipping roses. Now we are in the ringed wood with the wall round it. This is Elverdon. I have seen signposts at the crossroads with one arm pointing to Elverdon. No one has been there. The ferns smell very strong, and there are red funguses growing beneath them. Now we wake the sleeping doors who have never seen a human form, now we tread on rotten oak apples, red with age and slippery. There is a ring of wall round this wood, nobody comes here. Listen. That is the flop of a giant toad in the undergrowth, that is the patter of some prime val fir cone falling to rot among the ferns. Put your foot on this brick. Look over the wall. That is Elverdon. The lady sits between the two long windows, writing. The gardeners sweep the lawn with giant brooms. We are the first to come here. We are the discoverers of an unknown land. Do not stir, if the gardeners saw us they would shoot us. We should be nailed like stoats to the stable door. Look. Do not move. Grasp the ferns tight on the top of the wall. I see the lady writing. I see the gardener sweeping, said Susan. If we died here, nobody would bury us. Run, said Bernard. Run. The gardener with the black beard has seen us. We shall be shot. We shall be shot like jays and pinned to the wall. We are in a hostile country. We must escape to the beechwood. We must hide under the trees. I turned a twig as we came. There is a secret path. Bend as low as you can. Follow without looking back. They will think we are foxes. Run. Now we are safe. Now we can stand upright again. Now we can stretch our arms in this high canopy, in this vast wood. I hear nothing. That is only the murmur of the waves in the air. That is a wood pigeon breaking cover in the tops of the beech trees. The pigeon beats the air, the pigeon beats the air with wooden wings. Now you trail away, said Susan, making phrases. Now you mount like an air ball's string, higher and higher through the layers of the leaves, out of reach. Now you lag. Now you tug at my skirts, looking back, making phrases. You have escaped me. Here is the garden. Here is the hedge. Here is Rhoda on the path rocking petals to and fro in her brown basin. All my ships are white, said Rhoda. I do not want red petals of hollyhocks or geranium. I want white petals that float when I tip the basin up. I have a fleet now swimming from shore to shore. I will drop a twig in as a raft for a drowning sailor. I will drop a stone in and see bubbles rise from the depths of the sea. Neville has gone and Susan has gone, Ginny is in the kitchen garden picking currants with Louis perhaps. 
I have a short time alone, while Miss Hudson spreads our copybooks on the schoolroom table. I have a short space of freedom. I have picked all the fallen petals and made them swim. I have put raindrops in some. I will plant a lighthouse here, ahead of Sweet Alice. And I will now walk the brown basin from side to side so that my ships may ride the waves. Some will founder. Some will dash themselves against the cliffs. One sails alone. That is my ship. It sails into icy caverns where the sea bear barks and stalactites swing green chains. The waves rise, their crests curl, look at the lights on the mastheads. They have scattered, they have foundered, all except my ship, which mounts the wave and sweeps before the gale and reaches the islands where the parrots chatter and the creepers. Where is Bernard? said Neville. He has my knife. We were in the tool shed making boats, and Susan came past the door. And Bernard dropped his boat and went after her taking my knife, the sharp one that cuts the keel. He is like a dangling wire, a broken bell pull, always twangling. He is like the seaweed hung outside the window, damp now, now dry. He leaves me in the lurch, he follows Susan, and if Susan cries he will take my knife and tell her stories. The big blade is an emperor the broken blade a negro. I hate dangling things, I hate dampish things. I hate wandering and mixing things together. Now the bell rings and we shall be late. Now we must drop our toys. Now we must go in together. The copybooks are laid out side by side on the green baize table. I will not conjugate the verb, said Louis, until Bernard has said it. My father is a banker in Brisbane and I speak with an Australian accent. I will wait and copy Bernard. He is English. They are all English. Susan's father is a clergyman. Rhoda has no father. Bernard and Neville are the sons of gentlemen. Jeannie lives with her grandmother in London. Now they suck their pens. Now they twist their copybooks, and, looking sideways at Miss Hudson, count the purple buttons on her bodice. Bernard has a chip in his hair. Susan has a red look in her eyes. Both are flushed. But I am pale, I am neat, and my knickerbockers are drawn together by a belt with a brass snake. I know the lesson by heart. I know more than they will ever know. I knew my cases and my genders, I could know everything in the world if I wished. But I do not wish to come to the top and say my lesson. My roots are threaded, like fibers in a flower pot, round and round about the world. I do not wish to come to the top and live in the light of this great clock, yellow-faced, which ticks and ticks. Ginny and Susan, Bernard and Neville bind themselves into a thong with which to lash me. They laugh at my neatness, at my Australian accent. I will now try to imitate Bernard's softly lisping Latin. Those are white words, said Susan, like stones one picks up by the seashore. They flick their tails right and left as I speak them, said Bernard. They wag their tails, they flick their tails, they move through the air in flocks, now this way, now that way, moving all together, now dividing, now coming together. Those are yellow words, those are fiery words, said Ginny. I should like a fiery dress, a yellow dress, a fulvous dress to wear in the evening. Each tense, said Neville, means differently. There is an order in this world, there are distinctions, there are differences in this world, upon whose verge I step. For this is only a beginning. Now Miss Hudson, said Rhoda, has shut the book. Now the terror is beginning. Now taking her lump of chalk she draws figures, six, seven, eight, and then a cross and then a line on the blackboard. What is the answer? The others look, they look with understanding. Louis writes, Susan writes, Neville writes, Ginny writes, even Bernard has now begun to write. But I cannot write. I see only figures. The others are handing in their answers, one by one. Now it is my turn. 
but I have no answer. The others are allowed to go. They slam the door. Miss Hudson goes. I am left alone to find an answer. The figures mean nothing now. Meaning has gone. The clock ticks. The two hands are convoys marching through a desert. The black bars on the clock face are green oases. The long hand has marched ahead to find water. The other, painfully stumbles among hot stones in the desert. It will die in the desert. The kitchen door slams. Wild dogs bark far away. Look, the loop of the figure is beginning to fill with time, it holds the world in it. I begin to draw a figure and the world is looped in it, and I myself am outside the loop, which I now join, so, and seal up, and make entire. The world is entire, and I am outside of it, crying, oh save me, from being blown forever outside the loop of time. Their rider sits staring at the blackboard, said Louis, in the schoolroom, while we ramble off, picking here a bit of time, pinching here a leaf of southernwood while Bernard tells a story. Her shoulder blades meet across her back like the wings of a small butterfly. And as she stares at the chalk figures, her mind lodges in those white circles, it steps through those white loops into emptiness, alone. They have no meaning for her. She has no answer for them. She has no body as the others have. And I, who speak with an Australian accent, whose father is a banker in Brisbane, do not fear her as I fear the others. Let us now crawl, said Bernard, under the canopy of the current leaves, and tell stories. Let us inhabit the underworld. Let us take possession of our secret territory, which is lit by pendant currents like candelabra, shining red on one side, black on the other. Here, Ginny, if we curl up close, we can sit under the canopy of the current leaves and watch the senses swing. This is our universe. The others pass down the carriage drive. The skirts of Miss Hudson and Miss Curry sweep by like candle extinguishers. Those are Susan's white socks. Those are Louis Neat Sanchez firmly printing the gravel. Here come warm gusts of decomposing leaves, of rotting vegetation. We are in a swamp now in a malarial jungle. There is an elephant white with maggots, killed by an arrow shot dead in its eye. The bright eyes of hopping birds, eagles, vultures, are apparent. They take us for fallen trees. They pick at a worm that is a hooded cobra and leave it with a festering brown scar to be mauled by lions. This is our world, lit with crescents and stars of light, and great petals half transparent block the openings like purple windows. Everything is strange. Things are huge and very small. The stalks of flowers are thick as oak trees. Leaves are high as the domes of vast cathedrals. We are giants, lying here, who can make forests quiver. This is here, said Ginny, this is now. But soon we shall go. Soon Miss Curry will blow her whistle. We shall walk. We shall part. You will go to school. You will have masters wearing crosses with white ties. I shall have a mistress in a school on the east coast who sits under a portrait of Queen Alexandra. That is where I am going, and Susan and Rhoda. This is only here, this is only now. Now we lie under the current bushes and every time the breeze stirs we are mottled all over. My hand is like a snake's skin. My knees are pink floating islands. Your face is like an apple tree netted under. The heat is going, said Bernard, from the jungle. The leaves flap black wings over us. Miss Curry has blown her whistle on the terrace. We must creep out from the awning of the current leaves and stand upright. There are twigs in your hair, Ginny. There is a green caterpillar on your neck. We must form, two by two. Miss Curry is taking us for a brisk walk while Miss Hudson sits at her desk settling her accounts. It is dull, said Ginny, walking along the high road with no windows to look at, with no blid eyes of blue glass let into the pavement. We must form into pairs, said Susan, and walk in order, not shuffling our feet, not lagging, 
with Louis going first to lead us, because Louis is alert and not a wool gatherer. Since I am supposed, said Neville, to be too delicate to go with them, since I get so easily tired and then am sick, I will use this hour of solitude, this reprieve from conversation, to coast round the purlieus of the house and recover, if I can, by standing on the same stair halfway up the landing, what I felt when I heard about the dead man through the swing door last night when Cook was shoving in and out the dampers. He was found with his throat cut. The apple tree leaves became fixed in the sky, the moon glared, I was unable to lift my foot up the stair. He was found in the gutter. His blood gurgled down the gutter. His jowl was white as a dead codfish. I shall call this stricture, this rigidity, death among the apple trees forever. There were the floating, pale grey clouds, and the immitigable tree, the implacable tree with its grieved silver bark. The ripple of my life was unavailing. I was unable to pass by. There was an obstacle. I cannot surmount this unintelligible obstacle, I said. And the others passed on. But we are doomed, all of us, by the apple trees, by the immitigable tree which we cannot pass. Now the stricture and rigidity are over, and I will continue to make my survey of the purlieus of the house in the late afternoon, in the sunset, when the sun makes oleaginous spots on the linoleum, and a crack of light kneels on the wall, making the chair legs look broken. I saw Flory in the kitchen garden, said Susan, as we came back from our walk, with the washing blown out round her, the pyjamas, the drawers, the nightgowns blown tight. And Ernest kissed her. He was in his green baize apron, cleaning silver, and his mouth was sucked like a purse in wrinkles and he seized her with the pyjamas blown out hard between them. He was blind as a bull, and she swooned in anguish, only little veins streaking her white cheeks red. Now though they pass plates of bread and butter and cups of milk at tea time I see a crack in the earth and hot steam hisses up, and the urn roars as Ernest roared, and I am blown out hard like the pyjamas, even while my teeth meet in the soft bread and butter, and I lap the sweet milk. I am not afraid of heat, nor of the frozen winter. Rhoda dreams, sucking a crust soaked in milk, Louis regards the wall opposite with snail green eyes, Bernard moulds his bread into pellets and calls them people. Neville with his clean and decisive ways has finished. He has rolled his napkin and slipped it through the silver ring. Ginny spins her fingers on the tablecloth, as if they were dancing in the sunshine, pirouetting. But I am not afraid of the heat or of the frozen winter. Now, said Louis, we all rise, we all stand up. Miss Curry spreads wide the black book on the harmonium. It is difficult not to weep as we sing, as we pray that God may keep us safe while we sleep, calling ourselves little children. When we are sad and trembling with apprehension it is sweet to sing together, leaning slightly, I towards Susan, Susan towards Bernard, clasping hands, afraid of much, I of my accent, rode of figures, yet resolute to conquer. We troop upstairs like ponies, said Bernard, stamping, clattering one behind another to take our turns in the bathroom. We buffet, we tussle, we spring up and down on the hard, white beds. My turn has come. I come now. Mrs. Constable, girt in a bath towel, takes her lemon-coloured sponge and soaks it in water, it turns chocolate brown, it drips, and, holding it high above me, shivering beneath her, she squeezes it. Water pours down the runnel of my spine. Bright arrows of sensation shoot on either side. I am covered with warm flesh. My dry crannies are wetted, my cold body is warmed, it is sluiced and gleaming. Water descends and sheets me like an eel. Now hot towels envelop me, and their roughness, as I rub my back, makes my blood purr. Rich and heavy sensations form on the roof of my mind, down showers the day, the woods, and Elverdon, Susan and the pigeon. Pouring down the walls of my mind, running together, the day falls copious, resplendent. Now I tie my pyjamas loosely round me, 
and lie under this thin sheet afloat in the shallow light which is like a film of water drawn over my eyes by a wave. I hear through it far off, far away, faint and far, the chorus beginning, wheels, dogs, men shouting, church bells, the chorus beginning. As I fold up my frock and my chemise, said Rhoda, so I put off my hopeless desire to be Susan, to be Ginny. But I will stretch my toes so that they touch the rail at the end of the bed, I will assure myself, touching the rail, of something hard. Now I cannot sink, cannot altogether fall through the thin sheet now. Now I spread my body on this frail mattress and hang suspended. I am above the earth now. I am no longer upright, to be knocked against and damaged. All is soft, and bending. Walls and cupboards whiten and bend their yellow squares on top of which a pale glass gleams. Out of me now my mind can pour. I can think of my armadas sailing on the high waves. I am relieved of hard contacts and collisions. I sail on alone under the white cliffs. Oh, but I sink, I fall. That is the corner of the cupboard, that is the nursery looking glass. But they stretch, they elongate. I sink down on the black plumes of sleep, its thick wings are pressed to my eyes. Travelling through darkness I see the stretched flower beds, and Mrs. Constable runs from behind the corner of the pampas grass to say my aunt has come to fetch me in a carriage. I mount, I escape, I rise on spring-heeled boots over the treetops. But I am now fallen into the carriage at the hall door, where she sits nodding yellow plumes with eyes hard like glazed marbles. Oh to awake from dreaming. Look, there is the chest of drawers. Let me pull myself out of these waters. But they heap themselves on me, they sweep me between their great shoulders, I am turned, I am tumbled, I am stretched, among these long lights, these long waves, these endless paths, with people pursuing, pursuing. The sun rose higher. Blue waves, Green waves swept a quick fan over the beach, circling the spike of sea holly and leaving shallow pools of light here and there on the sand. A faint black rim was left behind them. The rocks which had been misty and soft hardened and were marked with red clefts. Sharp stripes of shadow lay on the grass, and the dew dancing on the tips of the flowers and leaves made the garden like a mosaic of single sparks not yet formed into one whole. The birds, whose breasts were specked canary and rose, now sang a strain or two together, wildly, like skaters rollicking arm in arm, and were suddenly silent, breaking asunder. The sun laid broader blades upon the house. The light touched something green in the window corner and made it a lump of emerald, a cave of pure green like stoneless fruit. It sharpened the edges of chairs and tables and stitched white tablecloths with fine gold wires. As the light increased a bud here and there split asunder and shook out flowers, green veined and quivering, as if the effort of opening had set them rocking, and peeling a faint carillion as they beat their frail clappers against their white walls. Everything became softly amorphous, as if the china of the plate flowed and the steel of the knife were liquid. Meanwhile the concussion of the waves breaking fell with muffled thuds, like logs falling, on the shore. Now, said Bernard, the time has come. The day has come. The cab is at the door. My huge box bends George's bander legs even wider. The horrible ceremony is over, the tips, and the goodbyes in the hall. Now there is this gulping ceremony with my mother, this handshaking ceremony with my father, now I must go on waving, I must go on waving, till we turn the corner. Now that ceremony is over. Heaven be praised, all ceremonies are over. I am alone, I am going to school for the first time. Everybody seems to be doing things for this moment only, and never again. Never again. The urgency of it all is fearful. Everybody knows I am going to school, going to school for the first time. That boy is going to school for the first time, says the housemaid, cleaning the steps. I must not cry. I must behold them indifferently. Now the awful portals of the station gate, the moon-faced clock regards me. I must make phrases and phrases and so interpose something hard between myself and the stare of housemaids, the stare of clocks, 
staring faces, indifferent faces, or I shall cry. There is Louis, there is Neville, in long coats, carrying handbags, by the booking office. They are composed. But they look different. Here is Bernard, said Louis. He is composed, he is easy. He swings his bag as he walks. I will follow Bernard, because he is not afraid. We are drawn through the booking office onto the platform as a stream draws twigs and straws round the piers of a bridge. There is the very powerful, bottle green engine without a neck, all back and thighs, breathing steam. The guard blows his whistle, the flag is dipped, without an effort, of its own momentum, like an avalanche started by a gentle push, we start forward. Bernard spreads a rug and plays knuckle bones. Neville reads. London crumbles. London heaves and surges. There is a bristling of chimneys and towers. There are white church, there are mast among the spires. There are canal. Now there are open spaces with asphalt paths upon which it is strange that people should now be walking. There is a hill striped with red houses. A man crosses a bridge with a dog at his heels. Now the red boy begins firing at a pheasant. The blue boy shoves him aside. My uncle is the best shot in England. My cousin is master of foxhounds. Boasting begins. And I cannot boast, for my father is a banker in Brisbane, and I speak with an Australian accent. After all this hubbub, said Neville, all this scuffling and hubbub, we have arrived. This is indeed a moment, this is indeed a solemn moment. I come, like a lord to his halls appointed. That is our founder, our illustrious founder, standing in the courtyard with one foot raised. I salute our founder. A noble Roman air hangs over these austere quadrangles. Already the lights are lit in the form rooms. Those are laboratories perhaps, and that a library, where I shall explore the exactitude of the Latin language, and step firmly upon the well-laid sentences, and pronounce the explicit, the sonorous hexameters of Virgil, of Lucretius, and chant with a passion that is never obscure or formless the loves of Catullus, reading from a big book, a quarto with margins. I shall lie, too, in the fields among the tickling grasses. I shall lie with my friends under the towering elm trees. Behold, the headmaster. Alas, that he should excite my ridicule. He is too sleek, he is altogether too shiny and black, like some statue in a public garden. And on the left side of his waistcoat, his taut, his drum-like waistcoat, hangs a crucifix. Old Crane, said Bernard, now rises to address us. Old Crane, the headmaster, has a nose like a mountain at sunset, and a blue cleft in his chin, like a wooded ravine, which some tripper has fired, like a wooded ravine seen from the train window. He sways slightly, mouthing out his tremendous and sonorous words. I love tremendous and sonorous words. But his words are too hearty to be true. Yet he is by this time convinced of their truth. And when he leaves the room, lurching rather heavily from side to side, and hurls his way through the swing doors, all the masters, lurching rather heavily from side to side, hurl themselves also through the swing doors. This is our first night at school, apart from our sisters. This is my first night at school, said Susan, away from my father, away from my home. My eyes swell, my eyes prick with tears. I hate the smell of pine and linoleum. I hate the wind-bitten shrubs and the sanitary tiles. I hate the cheerful jokes and the glazed look of everyone. I left my squirrel and my doves for the boy to look after. The kitchen door slams, and shot patters among the leaves when Percy fires at the rooks. All here is false, all is meretricious. Rhoda and Ginny sit far off in brown serge, and look at Miss Lambert who sits under a picture of Queen Alexandra reading from a book before her. There is also a blue scroll of needlework embroidered by some old girl. If I do not purse my lips, if I do not screw my handkerchief, I shall cry. The purple light, said Rhoda, in Miss Lambert's ring passes to and fro across the black stain on the white page of the prayer book. 
it is a vinous, it is an amorous light. Now that our boxes are unpacked in the dormitories, we sit herded together under maps of the entire world. There are desks with wells for the ink. We shall write our exercises in ink here. But here I am nobody. I have no face. This great company, all dressed in brown serge, has robbed me of my identity. We are all callous, unfriended. I will seek out a face, a composed, a monumental face, and will endow it with omniscience, and wear it under my dress like a talisman and then, I promise this, I will find some dingle in a wood where I can display my assortment of curious treasures. I promise myself this. So I will not cry. That dark woman, said Ginny, with high cheekbones, has a shiny dress, like a shell, veined, for wearing in the evening. That is nice for summer, but for winter I should like a thin dress shot with red threads that would gleam in the firelight. Then when the lamps were lit, I should put on my red dress and it would be thin as a veil, and would wind about my body, and billow out as I came into the room, pirouetting. It would make a flower shape as I sank down, in the middle of the room, on a gilt chair. But Miss Lambert wears an opaque dress, that falls in a cascade from her snow-white ruffle as she sits under a picture of Queen Alexandra pressing one white finger firmly on the page. And we pray. Now we march, two by two, said Louis, orderly, processional, into chapel. I like the dimness that falls as we enter the sacred building. I like the orderly progress. We file in, we seat ourselves. We put off our distinctions as we enter. I like it now, when, lurching slightly, but only from his momentum, Dr. Crane mounts the pulpit and reads the lesson from a Bible spread on the back of the brass eagle. I rejoice, my heart expands in his bulk, in his authority. He lays the whirling dust clouds in my tremulous, my ignominiously agitated mind how we danced round the Christmas tree and handing parcels they forgot me, and the fat woman said, this little boy has no present, and gave me a shiny union jack from the top of the tree, and I cried with fury, to be remembered with pity. Now all is laid by his authority, his crucifix, and I feel come over me the sense of the earth under me, and my roots going down and down till they wrap themselves round some hardness at the centre. I recover my continuity, as he reads. I become a figure in the procession, a spoke in the huge wheel that turning, at last erects me, here and now. I have been in the dark, I have been hidden, but when the wheel turns, as he reads, I rise into this dim light where I just perceive, but scarcely, kneeling boys, pillars and memorial brasses. There is no crudity here, no sudden kisses. The brute menaces my liberty, said Neville, when he prays. Unwarmed by imagination, his words fall cold on my head like paving stones, while the gilt cross heaves on his waistcoat. The words of authority are corrupted by those who speak them. I jibe and mock at this sad religion, at these tremulous, grief-stricken figures advancing, cadaverous and wounded, down a white road shadowed by fig trees where boys sprawl in the dust, naked boys, and goatskins distended with wine hang at the tavern door. I was in Rome travelling with my father at Easter, and the trembling figure of Christ's mother was born niddle noddling along the streets, there went by also the stricken figure of Christ in a glass case. Now I will lean sideways as if to scratch my thigh. So I shall see Percival. There he sits, upright among the smaller fry. He breathes through his straight nose rather heavily. His blue and oddly inexpressive eyes are fixed with pagan indifference upon the pillar opposite. He would make an admirable churchwarden. He should have a birch and beat little boys for misdemeanors. He is allied with the Latin phrases on the memorial brasses. He sees nothing, he hears nothing. He is remote from us all in a pagan universe. But look, he flicks his hand to the back of his neck. For such gestures one falls hopelessly in love for a lifetime. Dalton, Jones, Edgar and Bateman flick their hands to the back of their necks likewise. But they do not succeed. At last, said Bernard, the growl ceases. The sermon ends. He has minced the dance of the white butterflies at the door to powder. His rough and hairy voice is like an unshaven chin. 
Now he lurches back to his seat like a drunken sailor. It is an action that all the other masters will try to imitate, but, being flimsy, being floppy, wearing grey trousers, they will only succeed in making themselves ridiculous. I do not despise them. Their antics seem pitiable in my eyes. I note the fact for future reference with many others in my notebook. When I am grown up I shall carry a notebook, a fat book with many pages, methodically lettered. I shall enter my phrases. Under B shall come butterfly powder. If, in my novel, I describe the sun on the windowsill, I shall look under B and find butterfly powder. That will be useful. The tree shades the window with green fingers. That will be useful. But alas! I am so soon distracted by a hair like twisted candy, by Celia's prayer book, ivory covered. Louis can contemplate nature, unwinking, by the hour. Soon I fail, unless talked to. The lake of my mind, unbroken by oars, heaves placidly and soon sinks into an oily somnolence. That will be useful. Now we move out of this cool temple, into the yellow playing fields, said Louis. And, as it is a half-holiday, the Duke's birthday, we will settle among the long grasses, while they play cricket. Could I be they I would choose it, I would buckle on my pads and stride across the playing field at the head of the batsman. Look now, how everybody follows Percival. He is heavy. He walks clumsily down the field, through the long grass, to where the great elm trees stand. His magnificence is that of some medieval commander. A wake of light seems to lie on the grass behind him. Look at us trooping after him, his faithful servants, to be shot like sheep, for he will certainly attempt some forlorn enterprise and die in battle. My heart turns rough, it abrades my side like a file with two edges, one, that I adore his magnificence, the other I despise his slovenly accents, I who am so much his superior, and am jealous. And now, said Neville, let Bernard begin. Let him burble on, telling us stories, while we lie recumbent. Let him describe what we have all seen so that it becomes a sequence. Bernard says there is always a story. I am a story. Louis is a story. There is the story of the boot boy, the story of the man with one eye, the story of the woman who sells winkles. Let him burble on with his story while I lie back and regard the stiff-legged figures of the padded batsmen through the trembling grasses. It seems as if the whole world were flowing and curving on the earth the trees, in the sky the clouds. I look up, through the trees, into the sky. The match seems to be played up there. Faintly among the soft, white clouds I hear the cry run, I hear the cry how's that? The clouds lose tufts of whiteness as the breeze dishevels them. If that blue could stay forever, if that hole could remain forever, if this moment could stay forever. But Bernard goes on talking. Up they bubble images. Like a camel. A vulture. The camel is a vulture, the vulture a camel, for Bernard is a dangling wire, loose, but seductive. Yes, for when he talks, when he makes his foolish comparisons, a lightness comes over one. One floats, two, as if one were that bubble, one is freed, I have escaped, one feels. Even the chubby little boys, Dalton, Larpent and Baker, feel the same abandonment. They like this better than the cricket. They catch the phrases as they bubble. They let the feathery grasses tickle their noses. And then we all feel Percival lying heavy among us. His curious guffaw seems to sanction our laughter. But now he has rolled himself over in the long grass. He is, I think, chewing a stalk between his teeth. He feels bored, I too feel bored. Bernard at once perceives that we are bored. I detect a certain effort, an extravagance in his phrase, as if he said look, but Percival says no. For he is always the first to detect insincerity, and is brutal in the extreme. The sentence tails off feebly. Yes, the appalling moment has come when Bernard's power fails him and there is no longer any sequence and he sags and twiddles a bit of string and falls silent, gaping as if about to burst into tears. 
Among the tortures and devastations of life is this then our friends are not able to finish their stories. Now let me try, said Louis, before we rise, before we go to tea, to fix the moment in one effort of supreme endeavor. This shall endure. We are parting, some to tea, some to the nets, I to show my essay to Mr. Barker. This will endure. From discord, from hatred, I despise dabblers in imagery I resent the power of Percival intensely, my shattered mind is pieced together by some sudden perception. I take the trees, the clouds, to be witnesses of my complete integration. I, Louis, I, who shall walk the earth these seventy years, am born entire, out of hatred, out of discord. Here on this ring of grass we have sat together, bound by the tremendous power of some inner compulsion. The trees wave, the clouds pass. The time approaches when these soliloquies shall be shared. We shall not always give out a sound like a beaten gong as one sensation strikes and then another. Children, our lives have been gong striking, clamor and boasting, cries of despair, blows on the nape of the neck in gardens. Now grass and trees, the traveling air blowing empty spaces in the blue which they then recover, shaking the leaves which then replace themselves, and our ring here, sitting, with our arms binding our knees, hint at some other order, and better, which makes a reason everlastingly. This I see for a second, and shall try tonight to fix in words, to forge in a ring of steel, though Percival destroys it, as he blunders off, crushing the grasses, with the small fry trotting subservient after him. Yet it is Percival I need, for it is Percival who inspires poetry. For how many months, said Susan, for how many years, have I run up these stairs, in the dismal days of winter, in the chilly days of spring? Now it is midsummer. We go upstairs to change into white frocks to play tennis, Ginny and I with Rhoda following after. I count each step as I mount, counting each step something done with. So each night I tear off the old day from the calendar, and screw it tight into a ball. I do this vindictively, while Betty and Clara are on their knees. I do not pray. I revenge myself upon the day. I wreak my spite upon its image. You are dead now, I say, school day, hated day. They have made all the days of June, this is the twenty-fifth shiny and orderly, with gongs, with lessons, with orders to wash to change, to work, to eat. We listen to missionaries from China. We drive off in breaks along the asphalt pavement, to attend concerts in halls. We are shown galleries and pictures. At home the hay waves over the meadows. My father leans upon the stile, smoking. In the house one door bangs and then another, as the summer air puffs along the empty passages. Some old picture perhaps swings on the wall. A petal drops from the rose in the jar. The farm wagons strew the hedges with tufts of hay. All this I see, I always see, as I pass the looking glass on the landing, with Ginny in front and Rhoda lagging behind. Ginny dances. Ginny always dances in the hall on the ugly, the encaustic tiles, she turns cartwheels in the playground, she picks some flower forbiddenly and sticks it behind her ear so that Miss Perry's dark eyes smolder with admiration, for Ginny, not me. Miss Perry loves Ginny, and I could have loved her, but now love no one, except my father, my doves, and the squirrel whom I left in the cage at home for the boy to look after. I hate the small looking glass on the stairs, said Ginny. It shows our heads only, it cuts off our heads. And my lips are too wide and my eyes are too close together, I show my gums too much when I laugh. Susan's head, with its fell look, with its grass-green eyes which poets will love, Bernard said, because they fall upon close white stitching, put mine out, even Rhoda's face, mooning, vacant, is completed, like those white petals she used to swim in her bowl. So I skip up the stairs past them, to the next landing, where the long glass hangs and I see myself entire. I see my body and head in one now, for even in this surge frock they are one, my body and my head. Look, when I move my head I ripple all down my narrow body, even my thin legs ripple like a stalk in the wind. 
I flicker between the set face of Susan and Rhoda's vagueness, I leap like one of those flames that run between the cracks of the earth, I move, I dance, I never cease to move and to dance. I move like the leaf that moved in the hedge as a child and frightened me. I dance over these streaked, these impersonal, distempered walls with their yellow skirting as firelight dances over teapots. I catch fire even from women's cold eyes. When I read, a purple rim runs round the black edge of the textbook. Yet I cannot follow any word through its changes. I cannot follow any thought from present to past. I do not stand lost, like Susan, with tears in my eyes remembering home, or lie, like Rhoda, crumpled among the ferns, staining my pink cotton green, while I dream of plants that flower under the sea, and rocks through which the fish swim slowly. I do not dream. Now let us be quick. Now let me be the first to pull off these coarse clothes. Here are my clean white stockings. Here are my new shoes. I bind my hair with a white ribbon, so that when I leap across the court the ribbon will stream out in a flash, yet curl round my neck, perfectly in its place. Not a hair shall be untidy. That is my face, said Rhoda, in the looking glass behind Susan's shoulder, that face is my face. But I will duck behind her to hide it, for I am not here. I have no face. Other people have faces, Susan and Ginny have faces, they are here. Their world is the real world. The things they lift are heavy. They say yes, they say no, whereas I shift and change and am seen through in a second. If they meet a housemaid she looks at them without laughing. But she laughs at me. They know what to say if spoken to. They laugh really, they get angry really, while I have to look first and do what other people do when they have done it. See now with what extraordinary certainty Ginny pulls on her stockings, simply to play tennis. That I admire. But I like Susan's way better, for she is more resolute, and less ambitious of distinction than Ginny. Both despise me for copying what they do, but Susan sometimes teaches me, for instance, how to tie a bow, while Ginny has her own knowledge but keeps it to herself. They have friends to sit by. They have things to say privately in corners. But I attach myself only to names and faces, and hoard them like amulets against disaster. I choose out across the hall some unknown face and can hardly drink my tea when she whose name I do not know sits opposite. I choke. I am rocked from side to side by the violence of my emotion. I imagine these nameless, these immaculate people, watching me from behind bushes. I leap high to excite their admiration. At night, in bed, I excite their complete wonder. I often die pierced with arrows to win their tears. If they should say, or I should see from a label on their boxes, that they were in Scarborough last holidays, the whole town runs gold, the whole pavement is illuminated. Therefore I hate looking glasses which show me my real face. Alone, I often fall down into nothingness. I must push my foot stealthily lest I should fall off the edge of the world into nothingness. I have to bang my head against some hard door to call myself back to the body. We are late, said Susan. We must wait our turn to play. We will pitch here in the long grass and pretend to watch Ginny and Clara, Betty and Mavis. But we will not watch them. I hate watching other people play games. I will make images of all the things I hate most and bury them in the ground. This shiny pebble is Madame Carlo, and I will bury her deep because of her fawning and ingratiating manners, because of the sixpence she gave me for keeping my knuckles flat when I played my scales. I buried her sixpence. I would bury the whole school, the gymnasium, the classroom, the dining room that always smells of meat, and the chapel. I would bury the red-brown tiles and the oily portraits of old men, benefactors, founders of schools. There are some trees I like, the cherry tree with lumps of clear gum on the bark, and one view from the attic towards some far hills. Save for these, I would bury it all as I bury these ugly stones that are always scattered about this briny coast, with its piers and its trippers. At home, the waves are mile long. On winter nights we hear them booming. 
Last Christmas a man was drowned sitting alone in his cart. When Miss Lambert passes, said Rhoda, talking to the clergyman, the others laugh and imitate her hunch behind her back, yet everything changes and becomes luminous. Ginny leaps higher too when Miss Lambert passes. Suppose she saw that daisy, it would change. Wherever she goes, things are changed under her eyes, and yet when she has gone is not the thing the same again. Miss Lambert is taking the clergyman through the wicket gate to her private garden, and when she comes to the pond, she sees a frog on a leaf, and that will change. All is solemn, all is pale where she stands, like a statue in a grove. She lets her tasseled silken cloak slip down, and only her purple ring still glows, her vinous, her amethystine ring. There is this mystery about people when they leave us. When they leave us I can companion them to the pond and make them stately. When Miss Lambert passes, she makes the daisy change, and everything runs like streaks of fire when she carves the beef. Month by month things are losing their hardness, even my body now lets the light through, my spine is soft like wax near the flame of the candle. I dream, I dream. I have won the game, said Ginny. Now it is your turn. I must throw myself on the ground and pant. I am out of breath with running, with triumph. Everything in my body seems thinned out with running and triumph. My blood must be bright red, whipped up, slapping against my ribs. My soles tingle, as if wire rings opened and shut in my feet. I see every blade of grass very clear. But the pulse drums so in my forehead, behind my eyes, that everything dances, the net, the grass, your faces leap like butterflies, the trees seem to jump up and down. There is nothing stayed, nothing settled, in this universe. All is rippling, all is dancing, all is quickness and triumph. Only, when I have lain alone on the hard ground, watching you play your game, I begin to feel the wish to be singled out, to be summoned, to be called away by one person who comes to find me, who is attracted towards me, who cannot keep himself from me, but comes to where I sit on my gilt chair, with my frock billowing round me like a flower. And withdrawing into an alcove, sitting alone on a balcony we talk together. Now the tide sinks. Now the trees come to earth, the brisk waves that slap my ribs rock more gently, and my heart rides at anchor, like a sailing boat whose sails slide slowly down onto the white deck. The game is over. We must go to tea now. The boasting boys, said Louis, have gone now in a vast team to play cricket. They have driven off in their great break, singing in chorus. All their heads turned simultaneously at the corner by the laurel bushes. Now they are boasting. Larpent's brother played football for Oxford, Smith's father made a century at Lord's. Archie and Hugh, Parker and Dalton, Larpent and Smith, then again Archie and Hugh, Parker and Dalton, Larpent and Smith, the names repeat themselves, the names are the same always. They are the volunteers, they are the cricketers, they are the officers of the Natural History Society. They are always forming into fours and marching in troops with badges on their caps, they salute simultaneously passing the figure of their general. How majestic is their order, how beautiful is their obedience! If I could follow, if I could be with them, I would sacrifice all I know. But they also leave butterflies trembling with their wings pinched off, they throw dirty pocket handkerchiefs clotted with blood screwed up into corners. They make little boys sob in dark passages. They have big red ears that stand out under their caps. Yet that is what we wish to be, Neville and I. I watch them go with envy. Peeping from behind a curtain, I note the simultaneity of their movements with delight. If my legs were reinforced by theirs, how they would run! If I had been with them and won matches and rode in great races, and galloped all day, how I should thunder out songs at midnight! In what a torrent the words would rush from my throat! Passable has gone now, said Neville. He is thinking of nothing but the match. He never waved his hand as the brake turned the corner by the laurel bush. He despises me for being too weak to play, 
yet he is always kind to my weakness. He despises me for not caring if they win or lose except that he cares. He takes my devotion, he accepts my tremulous, no doubt abject offering, mixed with contempt as it is for his mind. For he cannot read. Yet when I read Shakespeare or Catullus, lying in the long grass, he understands more than Louis. Not the words, but what are words? Do I not know already how to rhyme, how to imitate Pope, Dreden, even Shakespeare? But I cannot stand all day in the sun with my eyes on the ball, I cannot feel the flight of the ball through my body and think only of the ball. I shall be a clinger to the outsides of words all my life. Yet I could not live with him and suffer his stupidity. He will coarsen and snore. He will marry and there will be scenes of tenderness at breakfast. But now he is young. Not a thread, not a sheet of paper lies between him and the sun, between him and the rain, between him and the moon as he lies naked, tumbled, hot, on his bed. Now as they drive along the high road in their break his face is mottled red and yellow. He will throw off his coat and stand with his legs apart, with his hands ready, watching the wicket. And he will pray, Lord let us win, he will think of one thing only, that they should win. How could I go with them in a break to play cricket? Only Bernard could go with them, but Bernard is too late to go with them. He is always too late. He is prevented by his incorrigible moodiness from going with them. He stops, when he washes his hands, to say, there is a fly in that web. Shall I rescue that fly, shall I let the spider eat it? He is shaded with innumerable perplexities, or he would go with them to play cricket, and would lie in the grass, watching the sky, and would start when the ball was hit. But they would forgive him, for he would tell them a story. They have bowled off, said Bernard, and I am too late to go with them. The horrid little boys, who are also so beautiful, whom you and Louis, Neville, envy so deeply, have bowled off with their heads all turned the same way. But I am unaware of these profound distinctions. My fingers slip over the keyboard without knowing which is black and which white. Archie makes easily a hundred, I by a fluke make sometimes fifteen. But what is the difference between us? Wait though, Neville, let me talk. The bubbles are rising like the silver bubbles from the floor of a saucepan, image on top of image. I cannot sit down to my book, like Louis, with ferocious tenacity. I must open the little trapdoor and let out these linked phrases in which I run together whatever happens, so that instead of incoherence there is perceived a wandering thread, lightly joining one thing to another. I will tell you the story of the doctor. When Dr. Crane latches through the swing doors after prayers he is convinced, it seems, of his immense superiority, and indeed Neville, we cannot deny that his departure leaves us not only with a sense of relief, but also with a sense of something removed, like a tooth. Now let us follow him as he heaves through the swing door to his own apartments. Let us imagine him in his private room over the stables undressing. He unfastens his sock suspenders, let us be trivial, let us be intimate. Then with a characteristic gesture, it is difficult to avoid these ready-made phrases, and they are, in his case, somehow appropriate, he takes the silver, he takes the coppers from his trouser pockets and places them there, and there, on his dressing table. With both arms stretched on the arms of his chair he reflects, this is his private moment, it is here we must try to catch him shall he cross the pink bridge into his bedroom or shall he not cross it. The two rooms are united by a bridge of rosy light from the lamp at the bedside where Mrs. Crane lies with her hair on the pillow reading a French memoir. As she reads, she sweeps her hand with an abandoned and despairing gesture over her forehead, and sighs, is this all, comparing herself with some French duchess. Now, says the doctor, in two years I shall retire. I shall clip you hedges in a west country garden. An admiral I might have been, or a judge not a schoolmaster. What forces, he asks, staring at the gas fire with his shoulders hunched up more hugely than we know them, he is in his shirt sleeves remember, have brought me to this. What vast forces? He thinks, getting into the stride of his majestic phrases as he looks over his shoulder at the window.
It is a stormy night, the branches of the chestnut trees are plowing up and down. Stars flash between them. What vast forces of good and evil have brought me here? He asks, and sees with sorrow that his chair has worn a little hole in the pile of the purple carpet. So there he sits, swinging his braces. But stories that follow people into their private rooms are difficult. I cannot go on with this story. I twiddle a piece of string, I turn over four or five coins in my trouser pocket. Bernard's stories amuse me, said Neville, at the start. But when they tail off absurdly and he gapes, twiddling a bit of string, I feel my own solitude. He sees everyone with blurred edges. Hence I cannot talk to him of Percival. I cannot expose my absurd and violent passion to his sympathetic understanding. It too would make a story. I need someone whose mind falls like a chopper on a block, to whom the pitch of absurdity is sublime, and a shoestring adorable. To whom I can expose the urgency of my own passion. Louis is too cold, too universal. There is nobody here among these grey arches, and moaning pigeons, and cheerful games and tradition and emulation, all so skillfully organised to prevent feeling alone. Yet I am struck still as I walk by sudden premonitions of what is to come. Yesterday, passing the open door leading into the private garden, I saw Fenwick with his mallet raised. The steam from the tea urn rose in the middle of the lawn. There were banks of blue flowers. Then suddenly descended upon me the obscure, the mystic sense of adoration, of completeness that triumphed over chaos. Nobody saw my poised and intent figure as I stood at the open door. Nobody guessed the need I had to offer my being to one God, and perish, and disappear. His mallet descended, the vision broke. Should I seek out some tree? Should I desert these form rooms and libraries, and the broad yellow page in which I read Catullus, for woods and fields? Should I walk under beech trees, or saunter along the river bank, where the trees meet united like lovers in the water? But nature is too vegetable, too vapid. She has only sublimities and vastitudes and water and leaves. I begin to wish for firelight, privacy, and the limbs of one person. I begin to wish, said Louis, for night to come. As I stand here with my hand on the grained oak panel of Mr. Wickham's door I think myself the friend of Richelieu, or the Duke of St. Simon holding out a snuff-box to the king himself. It is my privilege. My witticisms run like wildfire through the court. Duchesses tear emeralds from their earrings out of admiration, but these rockets rise best in darkness, in my cubicle at night. I am now a boy only with a colonial accent holding my knuckles against Mr. Wickham's grained oak door. The day has been full of ignominies and triumphs concealed from fear of laughter. I am the best scholar in the school. But when darkness comes I put off this unenviable body, my large nose my thin lips, my colonial accent and inhabit space. I am then Virgil's companion, and Plato's. I am then the last scion of one of the great houses of France. But I am also one who will force himself to desert these windy and moonlit territories, these midnight wanderings, and confront grained oak doors. I will achieve in my life, heaven grant that it be not long, some gigantic amalgamation between the two discrepancies so hideously apparent to me. Out of my suffering I will do it. I will knock. I will enter. I have torn off the whole of May and June, said Susan, and twenty days of July. I have torn them off and screwed them up so that they no longer exist, save as a weight in my side. They have been crippled days, like moths with shriveled wings unable to fly. There are only eight days left. In eight days' time I shall get out of the train and stand on the platform at 6.25. Then my freedom will unfurl, and all these restrictions that wrinkle and shrivel hours and order and discipline, and being here and there exactly at the right moment, will crack asunder. Out the day will spring, as I open the carriage door and see my father in his old hat and gaiters. I shall tremble. I shall burst into tears. Then next morning I shall get up at dawn. I shall let myself out by the kitchen door. I shall walk on the moor. 
The great horses of the phantom riders will thunder behind me and stop suddenly. I shall see the swallow skim the grass. I shall throw myself on a bank by the river and watch the fish slip in and out among the reeds. The palms of my hands will be printed with pine needles. I shall there unfold and take out whatever it is I have made here, something hard. For something has grown in me here, through the winters and summers, on staircases, in bedrooms. I do not want, as Jimmy wants, to be admired. I do not want people, when I come in, to look up with admiration. I want to give, to be given, and solitude in which to unfold my possessions. Then I shall come back through the trembling lanes under the arches of the nut leaves. I shall pass an old woman wheeling a perambulator full of sticks, and the shepherd. But we shall not speak. I shall come back through the kitchen garden, and see the curved leaves of the cabbages pebbled with dew, and the house in the garden, blind with curtained windows. I shall go upstairs to my room, and turn over my own things, locked carefully in the wardrobe, my shells, my eggs, my curious grasses. I shall feed my doves and my squirrel. I shall go to the kennel and comb my spaniel. So gradually I shall turn over the hard thing that has grown here in my side. But here bells ring, feet shuffle perpetually. I hate darkness and sleep and night, said Ginny, and lie longing for the day to come. I long that the week should be all one day without divisions. When I wake early and the birds wake me I lie and watch the brass handles on the cupboard grow clear, then the basin, then the towel horse. As each thing in the bedroom grows clear, my heart beats quicker. I feel my body harden, and become pink, yellow, brown. My hands pass over my legs and body. I feel its slopes, its thinness. I love to hear the gong roar through the house and the stir begin, hear a thud, there a patter. Doors slam, water rushes. Here is another day, here is another day, I cry, as my feet touch the floor. It may be a bruised day, an imperfect day. I am often scolded. I am often in disgrace for idleness, for laughing, but even as Miss Matthews grumbles at my feather-headed carelessness, I catch sight of something moving, a speck of sun perhaps on a picture, or the donkey drawing the mowing machine across the lawn, or a sail that passes between the laurel leaves, so that I am never cast down. I cannot be prevented from pirouetting behind Miss Matthews into prayers. Now, too, the time is coming when we shall leave school and wear long skirts. I shall wear necklaces and a white dress without sleeves at night. There will be parties in brilliant rooms, and one man will single me out and will tell me what he has told no other person. He will like me better than Susan or Rhoda. He will find in me some quality, some peculiar thing. But I shall not let myself be attached to one person only. I do not want to be fixed, to be pinioned. I tremble, I quiver, like the leaf in the hedge, as I sit dangling my feet, on the edge of the bed, with a new day to break open. I have fifty years, I have sixty years to spend. I have not yet broken into my hoard. This is the beginning. There are hours and hours, said Rhoda, before I can put out the light and lie suspended on my bed above the world, before I can let the day drop down, before I can let my tree grow, quivering in green pavilions above my head. Here I cannot let it grow. Somebody knocks through it. They ask questions, they interrupt, they throw it down. Now I will go to the bathroom and take off my shoes and wash, but as I wash, as I bend my head down over the basin, I will let the Russian Empress's veil flow about my shoulders. The diamonds of the imperial crown blaze on my forehead. I hear the roar of the hostile mob as I step out onto the balcony. Now I dry my hands, vigorously, so that Miss, whose name I forget, cannot suspect that I am waving my fist at an infuriated mob. I am your Empress, people. My attitude is one of defiance. I am fearless. I conquer. But this is a thin dream. This is a papery tree. Miss Lambert blows it down. Even the sight of her vanishing down the corridor blows it to atoms. It is not solid, it gives me no satisfaction, this empress dream. 
It leaves me, now that it has fallen, here in the passage rather shivering. Things seem paler. I will go now into the library and take out some book, and read and look, and read again and look. Here is a poem about a hedge. I will wander down it and pick flowers, green cowbind and the moonlight coloured may, wild roses and ivy serpentine. I will clasp them in my hands and lay them on the desk's shiny surface. I will sit by the river's trembling edge and look at the water lilies, broad and bright, which lit the oak that overhung the hedge with moonlight beams of their own watery light. I will pick flowers, I will bind flowers in one garland and clasp them and present them, oh! To whom? There is some check in the flow of my being, a deep stream presses on some obstacle, it jerks, it tugs, some knot in the center resists. Oh, this is pain, this is anguish. I faint, I fail. Now my body thaws, I am unsealed, I am incandescent. Now the stream pours in a deep tide fertilizing, opening the shut, forcing the tight folded, flooding free. To whom shall I give all that now flows through me, from my warm, my porous body? I will gather my flowers and present them, oh! To whom? Sailors loiter on the parade, and amorous couples, the omnibuses rattle along the sea front to the town. I will give, I will enrich, I will return to the world this beauty. I will bind my flowers in one garland and advancing with my hand outstretched will present them, oh! To whom? Now we have received, said Louis, for this is the last day of the last term, Neville's and Bernard's and my last day, whatever our masters have had to give us. The introduction has been made, the world presented. They stay, we depart. The great doctor, whom of all men I most revere, swaying a little from side to side among the tables, the bound volumes, has dealt out Horace, Tennyson, the complete works of Keats and Matthew Arnold, suitably inscribed. I respect the hand which gave them. He speaks with complete conviction. To him his words are true, though not to us. Speaking in the gruff voice of deep emotion, fiercely, tenderly, he has told us that we are about to go. He has bid us quit ourselves like men. On his lips quotations from the Bible, from the Times, seem equally magnificent. Some will do this, others that. Some will not meet again. Neville, Bernard and I shall not meet here again. Life will divide us. But we have formed certain ties. Our boyish, our irresponsible years are over. But we have forged certain links. Above all, we have inherited traditions. These stone flags have been worn for six hundred years. On these walls are inscribed the names of men of war, of statesmen, of some unhappy poets, mine shall be among them. Blessings be on all traditions, on all safeguards and circumscriptions. I am most grateful to you men in black gowns, and you, dead, for your leading, for your guardianship, yet after all, the problem remains. The differences are not yet solved. Flowers toss their heads outside the window. I see wild birds, and impulses wilder than the wildest birds strike from my wild heart. My eyes are wild, my lips tight pressed. The bird flies, the flower dances, but I hear always the sullen thud of the waves, and the chained beast stamps on the beach. It stamps and stamps. This is the final ceremony, said Bernard. This is the last of all our ceremonies. We are overcome by strange feelings. The guard holding his flag is about to blow his whistle, the train breathing steam in another moment is about to start. One wants to say something, to feel something, absolutely appropriate to the occasion. One's mind is primed, one's lips are pursed. And then a bee drifts in and hums round the flowers in the bouquet which Lady Hampton, the wife of the general, keeps smelling to show her appreciation of the compliment. If the bee were to sting her nose. We are all deeply moved, yet irreverent, yet penitent, yet anxious to get it over, yet reluctant to part. The bee distracts us, its casual flight seems to deride our intensity. Humming vaguely, skimming widely, it is settled now on the carnation. Many of us will not meet again. 
We shall not enjoy certain pleasures again, when we are free to go to bed, or to sit up, when I need no longer smuggle in bits of candle ends and immoral literature. The bee now hums round the head of the great doctor. Larpent, John, Archie, Percival, Baker, and Smith I have liked them enormously. I have known one mad boy only. I have hated one mean boy only. I enjoy in retrospect my terribly awkward breakfasts at the headmaster's table with toast and marmalade. He alone does not notice the bee. If it were to settle on his nose he would flick it off with one magnificent gesture. Now he has made his joke, now his voice has almost broken but not quite. Now we are dismissed Louis, Neville and I forever. We take our highly polished books, scholastically inscribed in a little crabbed hand. We rise, we disperse, the pressure is removed. The bee has become an insignificant, a disregarded insect, flown through the open window into obscurity. Tomorrow we go. We are about to part, said Neville. Here are the boxes, here are the cabs. There is Percival in his billycock hat. He will forget me. He will leave my letters lying about among guns and dogs unanswered. I shall send him poems and he will perhaps reply with a picture postcard. But it is for that that I love him. I shall propose meeting under a clock, by some cross, and shall wait, and he will not come. It is for that that I love him. Oblivious, almost entirely ignorant, he will pass from my life. And I shall pass, incredible as it seems, into other lives, this is only an escapade perhaps, a prelude only. I feel already, though I cannot endure the doctor's pompous mummery and faked emotions, that things we have only dimly perceived draw near. I shall be free to enter the garden where Fenwick raises his mallet. Those who have despised me shall acknowledge my sovereignty. But by some inscrutable law of my being sovereignty and the possession of power will not be enough, I shall always push through curtains to privacy, and want some whispered words alone. Therefore I go, dubious, but elate, apprehensive of intolerable pain, yet I think bound in my adventuring to conquer after huge suffering, bound, surely, to discover my desire in the end. There, for the last time, I see the statue of our pious founder with the doves about his head. They will will forever about his head, whitening it, while the organ moans in the chapel. So I take my seat, and, when I have found my place in the comma of our reserved compartment, I will shade my eyes with a book to hide one tear, I will shade my eyes to observe, to peep at one face. It is the first day of the summer holidays. It is the first day of the summer holidays, said Susan. But the day is still rolled up. I will not examine it until I step out onto the platform in the evening. I will not let myself even smell it until I smell the cold green air off the fields. But already these are not school fields, these are not school hedges, the men in these fields are doing real things, they fill carts with real hay, and those are real cows, not school cows. But the carbolic smell of corridors and the chalky smell of schoolrooms is still in my nostrils. The glazed, shiny look of matchboard is still in my eyes. I must wait for fields and hedges, and woods and fields, and steep railway cuttings, sprinkled with gorse bushes, and trucks in sidings, and tunnels, and suburban gardens with women hanging out washing, and then fields again and children swinging on gates, to cover it over, to bury it deep, this school that I have hated. I will not send my children to school nor spend a night all my life in London. Here in this vast station everything echoes and booms hollowly. The light is like the yellow light under an awning. Ginny lives here. Ginny takes her dog for walks on these pavements. People here shoot through the streets silently. They look at nothing but shop windows. Their heads bob up and down all at about the same height. The streets are laced together with telegraph wires. The houses are all glass, all festoons and glitter, now all front doors and lace curtains, all pillars and white steps. But now I pass on, out of London again, the fields begin again, and the houses, and women hanging washing, and trees, and fields. London is now veiled, now vanished, now crumbled, now fallen. The carbolic and the pitch pine begin to lose their savour. I smell corn and turnips. 
I undo a paper packet tied with a piece of white cotton. The eggshells slide into the cleft between my knees. Now we stop at station after station, rolling out milk cans. Now women kiss each other and help with baskets. Now I will let myself lean out of the window. The air rushes down my nose and throat, the cold air, the salt air with the smell of turnip fields in it. And there is my father, with his back turned, talking to a farmer. I tremble, I cry. There is my father in gaiters. There is my father. I sit snug in my own corner going north, said Ginny, in this roaring express which is yet so smooth that it flattens hedges, lengthens hills. We flash past signal boxes, we make the earth rock slightly from side to side. The distance closes forever in a point, and we forever open the distance wide again. The telegraph poles bob up incessantly, one is felled, another rises. Now we roar and swing into a tunnel. The gentleman pulls up the window. I see reflections on the shining glass which lines the tunnel. I see him lower his paper. He smiles at my reflection in the tunnel. My body instantly of its own accord puts forth a frill under his gaze. My body lives a life of its own. Now the black window glass is green again. We are out of the tunnel. He reads his paper. But we have exchanged the approval of our bodies. There is then a great society of bodies, and mine is introduced, mine has come into the room where the gilt chairs are. Look all the windows of the villas and their white tented curtains dance, and the men sitting in the hedges in the cornfields with knotted blue handkerchiefs are aware too, as I am aware, of heat and rapture. One waves as we pass him. There are bowers and arbors in these villa gardens and young men in shirt sleeves on ladders trimming roses. A man on a horse canters over the field. His horse plunges as we pass. And the rider turns to look at us. We roar again through blackness. And I lie back, I give myself up to rapture, I think that at the end of the tunnel I enter a lamplit room with chairs, into one of which I sink, much admired, my dress billowing round me. But behold, looking up, I meet the eyes of a sow woman, who suspects me of rapture. My body shuts in her face, impertinently, like a parasol. I open my body, I shut my body at my will. Life is beginning. I now break into my hoard of life. It is the first day of the summer holidays, said Rhoda. And now, as the train passes by these red rocks, by this blue sea, the term, done with, forms itself into one shape behind me. I see its color. June was white. I see the fields white with daisies, and white with dresses, and tennis courts marked with white. Then there was wind and violent thunder. There was a star riding through clouds one night, and I said to the star, consume me. That was at midsummer, after the garden party and my humiliation at the garden party. Wind and storm colored July. Also, in the middle, cadaverous, awful, lay the grey puddle in the courtyard, when, holding an envelope in my hand, I carried a message. I came to the puddle. I could not cross it. Identity failed me. We are nothing, I said, and fell. I was blown like a feather, I was wafted down tunnels. Then very gingerly, I pushed my foot across. I laid my hand against a brick wall. I returned very painfully, drawing myself back into my body over the grey, cadaverous space of the puddle. This is life then to which I am committed. So I detached the summer term. With intermittent shocks, sudden as the springs of a tiger, life emerges heaving its dark crest from the sea. It is to this we are attached, it is to this we are bound, as bodies to wild horses. And yet we have invented devices for filling up the crevices and disguising these fishes. Here is the ticket collector. Here are two men, three women, there is a cat in a basket, myself with my elbow on the window sill. this is here and now. We draw on, we make off, through whispering fields of golden corn. Women in the fields are surprised to be left behind there, hoeing. The train now stamps heavily, breathes stertorously, as it climbs up and up. 
At last we are on the top of the moor. Only a few wild sheep live here, a few shaggy ponies, yet we are provided with every comfort, with tables to hold our newspapers, with rings to hold our tumblers. We come carrying these appliances with us over the top of the moor. Now we are on the summit. Silence will close behind us. If I look back over that bald head, I can see silence already closing and the shadows of clouds chasing each other over the empty moor, silence closes over our transient passage. This I say is the present moment, this is the first day of the summer holidays. This is part of the emerging monster to whom we are attached. Now we are off, said Louis. Now I hang suspended without attachments. We are nowhere. We are passing through England in a train. England slips by the window, always changing from hill to wood, from rivers and willows to towns again. And I have no firm ground to which I go. Bernard and Neville, Percival, Archie, Larpent and Baker go to Oxford or Cambridge, to Edinburgh, Rome, Paris, Berlin, or to some American university. I go vaguely, to make money vaguely. Therefore a poignant shadow, a keen accent, falls on these golden bristles, on these poppy-red fields, this flowing corn that never overflows its boundaries, but runs rippling to the edge. This is the first day of a new life, another spoke of the rising wheel. But my body passes vagrant as a bird's shadow. I should be transient as the shadow on the meadow, soon fading, soon darkening and dying there where it meets the wood, were it not that I coerce my brain to form in my forehead, I force myself to state, if only in one line of unwritten poetry, this moment, to mark this inch in the long, long history that began in Egypt, in the time of the pharaohs, when women carried red pitchers to the Nile. I seem already to have lived many thousand years. But if I now shut my eyes, if I fail to realize the meeting place of past and present, that I sit in a third-class railway carriage full of boys going home for the holidays, human history is defrauded of a moment's vision. It's I, that would see through me, shuts if I sleep now, through slovenliness, or cowardice, burying myself in the past, in the dark, or acquiesce, as Bernard acquiesces, telling stories, or boast, as Percival, Archie, John, Walter, Lathon, Larpent, Roper, Smith boast, the names are the same always, the names of the boasting boys. They are all boasting, all talking, except Neville, who slips a look occasionally over the edge of a French novel, and so will always slip into cushioned firelit rooms, with many books and one friend, while I tilt on an office chair behind a counter. Then I shall grow bitter and mock at them. I shall envy them their continuance down the safe traditional ways under the shade of old yew trees while I consort with cockneys and clerks, and tap the pavements of the city. But now disembodied, passing over fields without lodgment, there is a river, a man fishes, there is a spire, there is the village street with its bow windowed in, all is dreamlike and dim to me. These hard thoughts, this envy, this bitterness, make no lodgment in me. I am the ghost of Louis, an ephemeral passerby, in whose mind dreams have power, and garden sounds when in the early morning petals float on fathomless depths and the birds sing. I dash and sprinkle myself with the bright waters of childhood. Its thin veil quivers. But the chained beast stamps and stamps on the shore. Louis and Neville, said Bernard, both sit silent. Both are absorbed. Both feel the presence of other people as a separating wall. But if I find myself in company with other people, words at once make smoke rings, see how phrases at once begin to wreathe off my lips. It seems that a match is set to a fire, something burns. An elderly and apparently prosperous man, a traveller, now gets in. And I at once wish to approach him, I instinctively dislike the sense of his presence, cold, unassimilated, among us. I do not believe in separation. We are not single. Also I wish to add to my collection of valuable observations upon the true nature of human life. My book will certainly run to many volumes, embracing every known variety of man and woman. I fill my mind with whatever happens to be the contents of a room or a railway carriage as one fills a fountain pen in an ink pot. I have a steady unquenchable thirst.
Now I feel by imperceptible signs, which I cannot yet interpret but will later, that his defiance is about to thaw. His solitude shows signs of cracking. He has passed a remark about a country house. A smoke ring issues from my lips, about crops, and circles him, bringing him into contact. The human voice has a disarming quality, we are not single, we are one. As we exchange these few but amiable remarks about country houses, I furbish him up and make him concrete. He is indulgent as a husband but not faithful, a small builder who employs a few men. In local society he is important, is already a councillor, and perhaps in time will be mayor. He wears a large ornament, like a double tooth torn up by the roots, made of coral, hanging at his watch chain. Walter J. Trumbull is the sort of name that would fit him. He has been in America, on a business trip with his wife, and a double room in a smallish hotel cost him a whole month's wages. His front tooth is stopped with gold. The fact is that I have little aptitude for reflection. I require the concrete in everything. It is so only that I lay hands upon the world. A good phrase, however, seems to me to have an independent existence. Yet I think it is likely that the best are made in solitude. They require some final refrigeration which I cannot give them, dabbling always in warm soluble words. My method, nevertheless, has certain advantages over theirs. Neville is repelled by the grossness of Trumbull. Louis, glancing, tripping with the high step of a disdainful crane, picks up words as if in sugar tongs. It is true that his eyes, wild, laughing, yet desperate express something that we have not gauged. There is about both Neville and Louis a precision, an exactitude, that I admire and shall never possess. Now I begin to be aware that action is demanded. We approach a junction, at a junction I have to change. I have to board a train for Edinburgh. I cannot precisely lay fingers on this fact, it lodges loosely among my thoughts like a button, like a small coin. Here is the jolly old boy who collects tickets. I had one, I had one certainly. But it does not matter. Either I shall find it, or I shall not find it. I examine my note case. I look in all my pockets. These are the things that forever interrupt the process upon which I am eternally engaged of finding some perfect phrase that fits this very moment exactly. Bernard has gone, said Neville, without a ticket. He has escaped us, making a phrase, waving his hand. He talked as easily to the horse breeder or to the plumber as to us. The plumber accepted him with devotion. If he had a son like that, he was thinking, he would manage to send him to Oxford. But what did Bernard feel for the plumber? Did he not only wish to continue the sequence of the story which he never stops telling himself? He began it when he rolled his bread into pellets as a child. One pellet was a man, one was a woman. We are all pellets. We are all phrases in Bernard's story, things he writes down in his notebook under A or under B. He tells our story with extraordinary understanding, except of what we most feel. For he does not need us. He is never at our mercy. There he is, waving his arms on the platform. The train has gone without him. He has missed his connection. He has lost his ticket. But that does not matter. He will talk to the barmaid about the nature of human destiny. We are off, he has forgotten us already, we pass out of his view, we go on, filled with lingering sensations, half bitter, half sweet, for he is somehow to be pitied, breasting the world with half-finished phrases, having lost his ticket, he is also to be loved. Now I pretend again to read. I raise my book, till it almost covers my eyes. But I cannot read in the presence of horse dealers and plumbers. I have no power of ingratiating myself. I do not admire that man, he does not admire me. Let me at least be honest. Let me denounce this piffling, trifling, self-satisfied world, these horsehair seats, these coloured photographs of peers and parades. I could shriek aloud at the smug self-satisfaction, at the mediocrity of this world, which breeds horse dealers with coral ornaments hanging from their watch chains. There is that in me which will consume them entirely. 
My laughter shall make them twist in their seats, shall drive them howling before me. No, they are immortal. They triumph. They will make it impossible for me always to read Catullus in a third-class railway carriage. They will drive me in October to take refuge in one of the universities, where I shall become a don, and go with schoolmasters to Greece, and lecture on the ruins of the Parthenon. It would be better to breed horses and live in one of those red villas than to run in and out of the skulls of Sophocles and Euripides like a maggot, with a high-minded wife, one of those university women. That, however, will be my fate. I shall suffer. I am already at eighteen capable of such contempt that horse breeders hate me. That is my triumph, I do not compromise. I am not timid, I have no accent. I do not finick about fearing what people think of my father a banker at Brisbane like Louis. Now we draw near the centre of the civilised world. There are the familiar gasometers. There are the public gardens intersected by asphalt paths. There are the lovers lying shamelessly mouth to mouth on the burnt grass. Percival is now almost in Scotland, his train draws through the red moors, he sees the long line of the border hills and the Roman wall. He reads a detective novel, yet understands everything. The train slows and lengthens, as we approach London, the centre, and my heart draws out too, in fear, in exultation. I am about to meet, what? What extraordinary adventure waits me, among these mail vans, these porters, these swarms of people calling taxes? I feel insignificant, lost, but exultant. With a soft shock we stop. I will let the others get out before me. I will sit still one moment before I emerge into that chaos, that tumult. I will not anticipate what is to come. The huge uproar is in my ears. It sounds and resounds, under this glass roof like the surge of a sea. We are cast down on the platform with our handbags. We are whirled asunder. My sense of self almost perishes, my contempt. I become drawn in, tossed down, thrown sky high. I step out onto the platform, grasping tightly all that I possess, one bag. The sun rose. Bars of yellow and green fell on the shore gilding the ribs of the eaten-out boat and making the sea holly and its mailed leaves gleam blue as steel. Light almost pierced the thin swift waves as they raced fan-shaped over the beach. The girl who had shaken her head and made all the jewels, the topaz, the aquamarine, the water-coloured jewels with sparks of fire in them, dance, now bared her brows and with wide-opened eyes drove a straight pathway over the waves. Their quivering mackerel sparkling was darkened, they massed themselves, their green hollows deepened and darkened and might be traversed by shoals of wandering fish. As they splashed and drew back they left a black rim of twigs and cork on the shore and straws and sticks of wood, as if some light shallop had foundered and burst its sides and the sailor had swum to land and bounded up the cliff and left his frail cargo to be washed ashore. In the garden the birds that had sung erratically and spasmodically in the dawn on that tree, on that bush, now sang together in chorus, shrill and sharp, now together, as if conscious of companionship, now alone as if to the pale blue sky. They swerved, all in one flight, when the black cat moved among the bushes, when the cook threw cinders on the ash heap and startled them. Fear was in their song, an apprehension of pain, and joy to be snatched quickly now at this instant. Also they sang emulously in the clear morning air, swerving high over the elm tree, singing together as they chased each other, escaping, pursuing, pecking each other as they turned high in the air. And then tiring of pursuit and flight, lovelily they came descending, delicately declining, dropped down and sat silent on the tree, on the wall, with their bright eyes glancing, and their heads turned this way, that way, aware, awake, intensely conscious of one thing, one object in particular. Perhaps it was a snail shell, rising in the grass like a grey cathedral, a swelling building burnt with dark rings and shadowed green by the grass. Or perhaps they saw the splendour of the flowers making a light of flowing purple over the beds, through which dark tunnels of purple shade were driven between the stalks. Or they fixed their gaze on the small bright apple leaves, 
dancing yet withheld, stiffly sparkling among the pink-tipped blossoms. Or they saw the rain drop on the hedge, pendant but not falling, with a whole house bent in it, and towering elms, or, gazing straight at the sun, their eyes became gold beads. Now glancing this side, that side, they looked deeper, beneath the flowers, down the dark avenues into the unlit world where the leaf rots and the flower has fallen. Then one of them, beautifully darting, accurately alighting, spiked the soft, monstrous body of the defenseless worm, pecked again and yet again, and left it to fester. Down there among the roots where the flowers decayed, gusts of dead smells were wafted, drops formed on the bloated sides of swollen things. The skin of rotten fruit broke, and matter oozed too thick to run. Yellow excretions were exuded by slugs, and now and again an amorphous body with a head at either end swayed slowly from side to side. The gold-eyed birds darting in between the leaves observed that purulence, that wetness, quizzically. Now and then they plunged the tips of their beaks savagely into the sticky mixture. Now, too, the rising sun came in at the window, touching the red-edged curtain, and began to bring out circles and lines. Now in the growing light its whiteness settled in the plate, the blade condensed its gleam. Chairs and cupboards loomed behind so that though each was separate they seemed inextricably involved. The looking glass whitened its pool upon the wall. The real flower on the windowsill was attended by a phantom flower. Yet the phantom was part of the flower, for when a bud broke free the paler flower in the glass opened a bud too. The wind rose. The waves drummed on the shore, like turbaned warriors, like turbaned men with poisoned assegais who, whirling their arms on high, advance upon the feeding flocks, the white sheep. The complexity of things becomes more close, said Bernard, here at college, where the stir and pressure of life are so extreme, where the excitement of mere living becomes daily more urgent. Every hour something new is unburied in the great bran pie. What am I? I ask. This. No, I am that. Especially now, when I have left a room, and people talking, and the stone flags ring out with my solitary footsteps, and I behold the moon rising, sublimely, indifferently, over the ancient chapel, then it becomes clear that I am not one and simple, but complex and many. Bernard, in public, bubbles, in private, is secretive. That is what they do not understand, for they are now undoubtedly discussing me saying I escape them, am evasive. They do not understand that I have to effect different transitions, have to cover the entrances and exits of several different men who alternately act their parts as Bernard. I am abnormally aware of circumstances. I can never read a book in a railway carriage without asking, is he a builder? Is she unhappy? I was aware today acutely that poor Sims, with his pimple, was feeling, how bitterly, that his chance of making a good impression upon Billy Jackson was remote. Feeling this painfully, I invited him to dinner with Ada. This he will attribute to an admiration which is not mine. That is true. But joined to the sensibility of a woman, I am here quoting my own biographer, Bernard possessed the logical sobriety of a man. Now people who make a single impression, and that, in the main, a good one, for there seems to be a virtue in simplicity, are those who keep their equilibrium in midstream. I instantly see fish with their noses one way, the stream rushing past another. Cannon, Lysit, Peters, Hawkins, Larpent, Neville all fish in midstream. But you understand, you, myself, who always comes at a call, that would be a harrowing experience to call and for no one to come, that would make the midnight hollow and explains the expression of old men in clubs, they have given up calling for a self who does not come, you understand that I am only superficially represented by what I was saying tonight. Underneath, and, at the moment when I am most disparate, I am also integrated. I sympathize effusively, I also sit, like a toad in a hole, receiving with perfect coldness whatever comes. Very few of you who are now discussing me have the double capacity to feel, to reason. Lysit, you see, believes in running after hares, Hawkins has spent a most industrious afternoon in the library. Peters has his young lady at the circulating library. 
You are all engaged, involved, drawn in, and absolutely energized to the top of your bent all save Neville, whose mind is far too complex to be roused by any single activity. I also am too complex. In my case something remains floating, unattached. Now, as a proof of my susceptibility to atmosphere, here, as I come into my room, and turn on the light, and see the sheet of paper, the table, my gown lying negligently over the back of the chair, I feel that I am that dashing yet reflective man, that bold and deleterious figure, who, lightly throwing off his cloak, seizes his pen and at once flings off the following letter to the girl with whom he is passionately in love. Yes, all is propitious. I am now in the mood. I can write the letter straight off which I have begun ever so many times. I have just come in, I have flung down my hat and my stick, I am writing the first thing that comes into my head without troubling to put the paper straight. It is going to be a brilliant sketch which, she must think, was written without a pause, without an erasure. Look how unformed the letters are, there is a careless blot. All must be sacrificed to speed and carelessness. I will write a quick, running, small hand, exaggerating the downstroke of the Y and crossing the T thus, with a dash. The date shall be only Tuesday, the 17th, and then a question mark. But also I must give her the impression that though he, for this is not myself, is writing in such an offhand, such a slapdash way, there is some subtle suggestion of intimacy and respect. I must allude to talks we have had together, bring back some remembered scene. But I must seem to her, this is very important, to be passing from thing to thing with the greatest ease in the world. I shall pass from the service for the man who was drowned, I have a phrase for that, to Mrs. Moffat and her sayings, I have a note of them, and so to some reflections apparently casual but full of profundity, profound criticism is often written casually, about some book I have been reading, some out-of-the-way book. I want her to say as she brushes her hair or puts out the candle, where did I read that? Oh, in Bernard's letter. It is the speed, the hot, molten effect, the larval flow of sentence into sentence that I need. Who am I thinking of? Byron of course. I am, in some ways, like Byron. Perhaps a sip of Byron will help to put me in the vein. Let me read a page. No, this is dull, this is scrappy. This is rather too formal. Now I am getting the hang of it. Now I am getting his beat into my brain, the rhythm is the main thing in writing. Now, without pausing I will begin, on the very lilt of the stroke. Yet it falls flat. It peters out. I cannot get up steam enough to carry me over the transition. My true self breaks off from my assumed. And if I begin to rewrite it, she will feel Bernard is posing as a literary man, Bernard is thinking of his biographer, which is true. No, I will write the letter tomorrow directly after breakfast. Now let me fill my mind with imaginary pictures. Let me suppose that I am asked to stay at Restover, King's Lawton, Station Langley three miles. I arrive in the dusk. In the courtyard of this shabby but distinguished house there are two or three dogs, slinking, long-legged. There are faded rugs in the hall, a military gentleman smokes a pipe as he paces the terrace. The note is of distinguished poverty and military connections. A hunter's hoof on the writing table a favorite horse. Do you ride? Yes, sir, I love riding. My daughter expects us in the drawing room. My heart pounds against my ribs. She is standing at a low table, she has been hunting, she munches sandwiches like a tomboy. I make a fairly good impression on the colonel. I am not too clever, he thinks, I am not too raw. Also I play billiards. Then the nice maid who has been with the family thirty years comes in. The pattern on the plates is of oriental long-tailed birds. Her mother's portrait in muslin hangs over the fireplace. I can sketch the surroundings up to a point with extraordinary ease. But can I make it work? Can I hear her voice, the precise tone with which, when we are alone, she says Bernard? And then what next? The truth is that I need the stimulus of other people. 
Alone, over my dead fire, I tend to see the thin places in my own stories. The real novelist, the perfectly simple human being, could go on, indefinitely, imagining. He would not integrate, as I do. He would not have this devastating sense of grey ashes in a burnt-out grate. Some blind flaps in my eyes. Everything becomes impervious. I cease to invent. Let me recollect. It has been on the whole a good day. The drop that forms on the roof of the soul in the evening is round, many-coloured. There was the morning, fine, there was the afternoon, walking. I like views of spires across grey fields. I like glimpses between people's shoulders. Things kept popping into my head. I was imaginative, subtle. After dinner, I was dramatic. I put into concrete form many things that we had dimly observed about our common friends. I made my transitions easily. But now let me ask myself the final question, as I sit over this grey fire, with its naked promontories of black coal, which of these people am I? It depends so much upon the room. When I say to myself, Bernard, who comes? A faithful, sardonic man, disillusioned, but not embittered. A man of no particular age or calling. Myself, merely. It is he who now takes the poker and rattles the cinders so that they fall in showers through the grate. Lord, he says to himself, watching them fall, what a pother, and then he adds, lugubriously, but with some sense of consolation, Mrs. Moffat will come and sweep it all up, I fancy I shall often repeat to myself that phrase, as I rattle and bang through life, hitting first this side of the carriage, then the other, oh, yes, Mrs. Moffat will come and sweep it all up. And so to bed. In a world which contains the present moment, said Neville, why discriminate? Nothing should be named lest by so doing we change it. Let it exist, this bank, this beauty, and I, for one instant, steeped in pleasure. The sun is hot. I see the river. I see trees specked and burnt in the autumn sunlight. Boats float past, through the red, through the green. Far away a bell tolls, but not for death. There are bells that ring for life. A leaf falls, from joy. Oh, I am in love with life. Look how the willow shoots its fine sprays into the air. Look how through them a boat passes, filled with indolent, with unconscious, with powerful young men. They are listening to the gramophone, they are eating fruit out of paper bags. They are tossing the skins of bananas, which then sink eel-like, into the river. All they do is beautiful. There are cruets behind them and ornaments, their rooms are full of oars and oleographs but they have turned all to beauty. That boat passes under the bridge. Another comes. Then another. That is Percival, lounging on the cushions, monolithic, in giant repose. No, it is only one of his satellites, imitating his monolithic, his giant repose. He alone is unconscious of their tricks, and when he catches them at it he buffets them good-humouredly with a blow of his paw. They, too, have passed under the bridge through the fountains of the pendant trees, through its fine strokes of yellow and plum colour. The breeze stirs, the curtain quivers, I see behind the leaves the grave, yet eternally joyous buildings, which seem porous, not gravid, light, though set so immemorially on the ancient turf. Now begins to rise in me the familiar rhythm, words that have lain dormant now lift, now toss their crests, and fall and rise, and fall and rise again. I am a poet, yes. Surely I am a great poet. Boats and youth passing and distant trees, the falling fountains of the pendant trees. I see it all. I feel it all. I am inspired. My eyes fill with tears. Yet even as I feel this, I lash my frenzy higher and higher. It foams. It becomes artificial, insincere. Words and words and words, how they gallop, how they lash their long manes and tails, but for some fault in me I cannot give myself to their backs, I cannot fly with them, scattering women and string bags. There is some flaw in me, some fatal hesitancy, which, if I pass it over, turns to foam and falsity. 
Yet it is incredible that I should not be a great poet. What did I write last night if it was not good poetry? Am I too fast, too facile? I do not know. I do not know myself sometimes, or how to measure a name and count out the grains that make me what I am. Something now leaves me, something goes from me to meet that figure who is coming, and assures me that I know him before I see who it is. How curiously one is changed by the addition, even at a distance, of a friend. How useful an office one's friends perform when they recall us. Yet how painful to be recalled, to be mitigated, to have oneself adulterated, mixed up, become part of another. As he approaches I become not myself but never mixed with somebody, with whom? With Bernard? Yes, it is Bernard, and it is to Bernard that I shall put the question, who am I? How strange, said Bernard, the willow looks seen together. I was Byron, and the tree was Byron's tree, lacrimose, down showering, lamenting. Now that we look at the tree together, it has a combined look, each branch distinct, and I will tell you what I feel, under the compulsion of your clarity. I feel your disapproval, I feel your force. I become, with you, an untidy, an impulsive human being whose bandana handkerchief is forever stained with the grease of crumpets. Yes, I hold Gray's elegy in one hand, with the other I scoop out the bottom crumpet, that has absorbed all the butter and sticks to the bottom of the plate. This offends you, I feel your distress acutely. Inspired by it and anxious to regain your good opinion, I proceed to tell you how I have just pulled Passival out of bed, I describe his slippers, his table, his gutted candle, his surly and complaining accents as I pull the blankets off his feet, he burrowing like some vast cocoon meanwhile. I describe all this in such a way that, centered as you are upon some private sorrow, for a hooded shape presides over our encounter, you give way, you laugh and delight in me. My charm and flow of language, unexpected and spontaneous as it is, delights me too. Stop, you say. Ask me what I suffer. Stop, you say. Ask me what I suffer. Let me then create you. You have done as much for me. You lie on this hot bank, in this lovely, this fading, this still bright October day, watching boat after boat float through the combed out twigs of the willow tree. And you wish to be a poet, and you wish to be a lover. But the splendid clarity of your intelligence, and the remorseless honesty of your intellect, these Latin words I owe you, these qualities of yours make me shift a little uneasily and see the faded patches, the thin strands in my own equipment, bring you to a halt. You indulge in no mystifications. You do not fog yourself with rosy clouds, or yellow. Am I right? Have I read the little gesture of your left hand correctly? If so, give me your poems. Hand over the sheets you wrote last night in such a fervor of inspiration that you now feel a little sheepish. For you distrust inspiration, yours or mine. Let us go back together, over the bridge, under the elm trees, to my room, where, with walls round us and red serge curtains drawn, we can shut out these distracting voices, scents and savors of lime trees, and other lives, these pert shop girls, disdainfully tripping, these shuffling, heavy laden old women, these furtive glimpses of some vague and vanishing figure, it might be Ginny, it might be Susan, or was that Rhoda disappearing down the avenue. Again, from some slight twitch I guess you're feeling, I have escaped you, I have gone buzzing like a swarm of bees, endlessly vagrant, with none of your power of fixing remorselessly upon a single object. But I will return. When there are buildings like these, said Neville, I cannot endure that there should be shop girls. Their titter, their gossip, offends me, breaks into my stillness, and nudges me, in moments of purest exultation, to remember our degradation. But now we have regained our territory after that brief brush with the bicycles and the lime scent and the vanishing figures in the distracted street. Here we are masters of tranquility and order, inheritors of proud tradition. The lights are beginning to make yellow slits across the square. Mists from the river are filling these ancient spaces. They cling, gently, to the hoary stone. The leaves now are thick in country lanes, sheep cough in the damp fields, but here in your room we are dry. We talk privately. 
The fire leaps and sinks, making some knob bright. You have been reading Byron. You have been marking the passages that seem to approve of your own character. I find marks against all those sentences which seem to express a sardonic yet passionate nature, a moth-like impetuosity dashing itself against hard glass. You thought, as you drew your pencil there, I too throw off my cloak like that. I too snap my fingers in the face of destiny. Yet Byron never made tea as you do, who fill the pot so that when you put the lid on the tea spills over. There is a brown pool on the table it is running among your books and papers. Now you mop it up, clumsily, with your pocket handkerchief. You then stuff your handkerchief back into your pocket, that is not Byron, that is you, that is so essentially you that if I think of you in twenty years' time, when we are both famous, gouty and intolerable, it will be by that scene, and if you are dead, I shall weep. Once you were Tolstoy's young man, now you are Byron's young man, perhaps you will be Meredith's young man, then you will visit Paris in the Easter vacation and come back wearing a black tie, some detestable Frenchman whom nobody has ever heard of. Then I shall drop you. I am one person, myself. I do not impersonate Catullus, whom I adore. I am the most slavish of students, with here a dictionary, there a notebook in which I enter curious uses of the past participle. But one cannot go on forever cutting these ancient inscriptions clearer with a knife. Shall I always draw the red serge curtain close and see my book, laid like a block of marble, pale under the lamp? That would be a glorious life, to addict oneself to perfection, to follow the curve of the sentence wherever it might lead, into deserts, under drifts of sand, regardless of lures, of seductions, to be poor always and unkempt, to be ridiculous in Piccadilly. But I am too nervous to end my sentence properly. I speak quickly, as I pace up and down, to conceal my agitation. I hate your greasy handkerchiefs, you will stain your copy of Don Juan. You are not listening to me. You are making phrases about Byron. And while you gesticulate, with your cloak, your cane, I am trying to expose a secret told to nobody yet, I am asking you, as I stand with my back to you, to take my life in your hands and tell me whether I am doomed always to cause repulsion in those I love? I stand with my back to you fidgeting. No, my hands are now perfectly still. Precisely, opening a space in the bookcase, I insert Don Juan, there. I would rather be loved, I would rather be famous than follow perfection through the sand. But am I doomed to cause disgust? Am I a poet? Take it. The desire which is loaded behind my lips, cold as lead, fell as a bullet, the thing I aim at shop girls, women, the pretense, the vulgarity of life, because I love it, shoots at you as I throw, catch it, my poem. He has shot like an arrow from the room, said Bernard. He has left me his poem. Oh friendship, I too will press flowers between the pages of Shakespeare's sonnets. Oh friendship, how piercing are your darts, there, there, again there. He looked at me, turning to face me, he gave me his poem. All mists curl off the roof of my being. That confidence I shall keep to my dying day. Like a long wave, like a roll of heavy waters, he went over me, his devastating presence, dragging me open, laying bare the pebbles on the shore of my soul. It was humiliating, I was turned to small stones. All semblances were rolled up. You are not Byron, you are yourself. To be contracted by another person into a single being, how strange. How strange to feel the line that is spun from us lengthening its fine filament across the misty spaces of the intervening world. He is gone, I stand here, holding his poem. Between us is this line. But now, how comfortable, how reassuring to feel that alien presence removed, that scrutiny darkened and hooded over. How grateful to draw the blinds, and admit no other presence, to feel returning from the dark corners in which they took refuge, those shabby inmates, those familiars, whom, with his superior force, he drove into hiding. The mocking, the observant spirits who, even in the crisis and stab of the moment, watched on my behalf now come flocking home again. With their addition, I am Bernard, I am Byron, I am this, that and the other. 
They darken the air and enrich me, as of old, with their antics, their comments, and cloud the fine simplicity of my moment of emotion. For I am more selves than Neville thinks. We are not simple as our friends would have us to meet their needs. Yet love is simple. Now they have returned, my inmates, my familiars. Now the stab, the rent in my defences that Neville made with his astonishing fine rapier, is repaired. I am almost whole now, and see how jubilant I am, bringing into play all that Neville ignores in me. I feel, as I look from the window, parting the curtains, that would give him no pleasure, but it rejoices me. We use our friends to measure our own stature. My scope embraces what Neville never reaches. They are shouting hunting songs over the way. They are celebrating some run with the beagles. The little boys in caps who always turned at the same moment when the break went round the corner are clapping each other on the shoulder and boasting. But Neville, delicately avoiding interference, stealthily, like a conspirator, hastens back to his room. I see him sunk in his low chair gazing at the fire which has assumed for the moment an architectural solidity. If life, he thinks, could wear that permanence, if life could have that order, for above all he desires order, and detests my Byronic untidiness, and so draws his curtain, and bolts his door. His eyes, for he is in love, the sinister figure of love presided at our encounter, fill with longing, fill with tears. He snatches the poker and with one blow destroys that momentary appearance of solidity in the burning coals. All changes. And youth and love. The boat has floated through the arch of the willows and is now under the bridge. Percival, Tony, Archie, or another, will go to India. We shall not meet again. Then he stretches his hand for his copybook, a neat volume bound in mottled paper, and writes feverishly long lines of poetry, in the manner of whomever he admires most at the moment. But I want to linger, to lean from the window, to listen. There again comes that rollicking chorus. They are now smashing China, that also is the convention. The chorus, like a torrent jumping rocks, brutally assaulting old trees, pours with splendid abandonment headlong over precipices. On they roll, on they gallop, after hounds, after footballs, they pump up and down attached to oars like sacks of flour. All divisions are merged, they act like one man. The gusty October wind blows the uproar in bursts of sound and silence across the court. Now again they are smashing the china, that is the convention. An old, unsteady woman carrying a bag trots home under the fire-red windows. She is half afraid that they will fall on her and tumble her into the gutter. Yet she pauses as if to warm her knobbed, her rheumatic -y hands at the bonfire which flares away with streams of sparks and bits of blown paper. The old woman pauses against the lit window. A contrast. That I see and Neville does not see, that I feel and Neville does not feel. Hence he will reach perfection and I shall fail and shall leave nothing behind me but imperfect phrases littered with sand. I think of Louis now. What malevolent yet searching light would Louis throw upon this dwindling autumn evening, upon this china smashing and trolling of hunting songs, upon Neville? Byron, and our life here. His thin lips are somewhat pursed, his cheeks are pale, he pours in an office over some obscure commercial document. My father, a banker at Brisbane, being ashamed of him he always talks of him, failed. So he sits in an office, Louis the best scholar in the school. But I seeking contrasts often feel his eye on us, his laughing eye, his wild eye, adding us up like insignificant items in some grand total which he is forever pursuing in his office. And one day, taking a fine pen and dipping it in red ink, the addition will be complete, our total will be known, but it will not be enough. Bang! They have thrown a chair now against the wall. We are damned then. My case is dubious too. Am I not indulging in unwarranted emotions? Yes, as I lean out of the window and drop my cigarette so that it twirls lightly to the ground, I feel Louis watching even my cigarette. And Louis says, that means something. But what? People go on passing, said Louis. They pass the window of this eating shop incessantly. Motorcars, 
vans, motor omnibuses, and again motor omnibuses, vans, motor cars, they pass the window. In the background I perceive shops and houses, also the grey spires of a city church. In the foreground are glass shelves set with plates of buns and ham sandwiches. All is somewhat obscured by steam from a tea urn. A meaty, vaporish smell of beef and mutton, sausages and mash, hangs down like a damp net in the middle of the eating house. I prop my book against a bottle of Worcester sauce and try to look like the rest. Yet I cannot. They go on passing, they go on passing in disorderly procession. I cannot read my book, or order my beef, with conviction. I repeat, I am an average Englishman, I am an average clerk, yet I look at the little men at the next table to be sure that I do what they do. Supple-faced, with rippling skins, that are always twitching with the multiplicity of their sensations, prehensile like monkeys, graced to this particular moment, they are discussing with all the right gestures the sale of a piano. It blocks up the hall, so he would take a tenor. People go on passing, they go on passing against the spires of the church and the plates of ham sandwiches. The streamers of my consciousness waver out and are perpetually torn and distressed by their disorder. I cannot therefore concentrate on my dinner. I would take a tenor. The case is handsome, but it blocks up the hall. They dive and plunge like guillemots whose feathers are slippery with oil. All excesses beyond that norm are vanity. That is the mean, that is the average. Meanwhile the hats bob up and down, the door perpetually shuts and opens. I am conscious of flux, of disorder, of annihilation and despair. If this is all, this is worthless. Yet I feel, too, the rhythm of the eating house. It is like a wolf's tune, eddying in and out, round and round. The waitresses, balancing trays, swing in and out, round and round, dealing plates of greens, of apricot and custard, dealing them at the right time, to the right customers. The average men, including her rhythm in their rhythm, I would take a tenor, for it blocks up the hall, take their greens, take their apricots and custard. Where then is the break in this continuity? What the fissure through which one sees disaster? The circle is unbroken, the harmony complete. Here is the central rhythm, here the common mainspring. I watch it expand, contract, and then expand again. Yet I am not included. If I speak, imitating their accent, they prick their ears, waiting for me to speak again, in order that they may place me, if I come from Canada or Australia, I, who desire above all things to be taken to the arms with love, am alien, external. I, who would wish to feel close over me the protective waves of the ordinary, catch with the tail of my eye some far horizon, am aware of hats bobbing up and down in perpetual disorder. To me is addressed the plaint of the wandering and distracted spirit, a woman with bad teeth falters at the counter, bring us back to the fold, we who pass so dejectedly, bobbing up and down, past windows with plates of ham sandwiches in the foreground. Yes, I will reduce you to order. I will read in the book that is propped against the bottle of Worcester sauce. It contains some forged rings, some perfect statements, a few words, but poetry. You, all of you, ignore it. What the dead poet said, you have forgotten. And I cannot translate it to you so that its binding power ropes you in, and makes it clear to you that you are aimless, and the rhythm is cheap and worthless, and so remove that degradation which, if you are unaware of your aimlessness, pervades you making you senile, even while you are young. To translate that poem so that it is easily read is to be my endeavour. I, the companion of Plato, of Virgil, will knock at the grained oak door. I oppose to what is passing this ramrod of beaten steel. I will not submit to this aimless passing of billycock hats and homburg hats and all the plumed and variegated headdresses of women. Susan, whom I respect, would wear a plain straw hat on a summer's day. And the grinding and the steam that runs in unequal drops down the window pane, and the stopping and the starting with a jerk of motor omnibuses, and the hesitations at counters, and the words that trail drearily without human meaning, I will reduce you to order. My roots go down through veins of lead and silver, 
through damp, marshy places that exhale odors, to a knot made of oak roots bound together in the center. Sealed and blind, with earth stopping my ears, I have yet heard rumors of wars, and the nightingale, have felt the hurrying of many troops of men flocking hither and thither in quest of civilization like flocks of birds migrating seeking the summer, I have seen women carrying red pitchers to the banks of the Nile. I woke in a garden, with a blow on the nape of my neck, a hot kiss, Ginny's, remembering all this as one remembers confused cries and toppling pillars and shafts of red and black in some nocturnal conflagration. I am forever sleeping and waking. Now I sleep, now I wake. I see the gleaming tien, the glass cases full of pale yellow sandwiches, the men in round coats perched on stools at the counter, and also behind them, eternity. It is a stigma bent on my quivering flesh by a cowled man with a red-hot iron. I see this eating shop against the packed and fluttering bird's wings, many feathered, folded, of the past. Hence my pursed lips, my sickly pallor, my distasteful and uninviting aspect as I turn my face with hatred and bitterness upon Bernard and Neville, who saunter under yew trees, who inherit armchairs, and draw their curtains close, so that lamplight falls on their books. Susan, I respect, because she sits stitching. She sews under a quiet lamp in a house where the corn sighs close to the window and gives me safety. For I am the weakest, the youngest of them all. I am a child looking at his feet and the little runnels that the stream has made in the gravel. That is a snail, I say, that is a leaf. I delight in the snails, I delight in the leaf, I am always the youngest, the most innocent, the most trustful. You are all protected. I am naked. When the waitress with the plaited wreaths of hair swings past, she deals you your apricots and custard unhesitatingly, like a sister. You are her brothers. But when I get up, brushing the crumbs from my waistcoat, I slip too large a tip, a shilling, under the edge of my plate, so that she may not find it till I am gone, and her scorn, as she picks it up with laughter, may not strike on me till I am past the swing doors. Now the wind lifts the blind, said Susan, jars, bowls, matting and the shabby armchair with the hole in it are now become distinct. The usual faded ribbons sprinkle the wallpaper. The bird chorus is over, only one bird now sings close to the bedroom window. I will pull on my stockings and go quietly past the bedroom doors, and down through the kitchen, out through the garden past the greenhouse into the field. It is still early morning. The mist is on the marshes. The day is stark and stiff as a linen shroud. But it will soften, it will warm. At this hour, this still early hour, I think I am the field, I am the barn, I am the trees, mine are the flocks of birds, and this young hare who leaps, at the last moment when I step almost on him. Mine is the heron that stretches its vast wings lazily, and the cow that creaks as it pushes one foot before another munching, and the wild, swooping swallow, and the faint red in the sky, and the green when the red fades, the silence and the bell, the call of the man fetching cart horses from the fields, all are mine. I cannot be divided, or kept apart. I was sent to school, I was sent to Switzerland to finish my education. I hate linoleum, I hate fir trees and mountains. Let me now fling myself on this flat ground under a pale sky where the clouds pace slowly. The cart grows gradually larger as it comes along the road. The sheep gather in the middle of the field. The birds gather in the middle of the road, they need not fly yet. The wood smoke rises. The starkness of the dawn is going out of it. Now the day stirs. Color returns. The day waves yellow with all its crops. The earth hangs heavy beneath me. But who am I, who lean on this gate and watch my setter nose in a circle? I think sometimes, I am not twenty yet, I am not a woman, but the light that falls on this gate, on this ground. I am the seasons, I think sometimes, January, May, November, the mud, the mist, the dawn. I cannot be tossed about, or float gently, or mix with other people. Yet now, leaning here till the gate prints my arm, I feel the weight that has formed itself in my side. Something has formed, at school, in Switzerland, some hard thing. 
Not sighs and laughter, not circling and ingenious phrases, not Rhoda's strange communications when she looks past us, over our shoulders, nor Ginny's pirouetting, all of a piece, limbs and body. What I give is foul. I cannot float gently, mixing with other people. I like best the stare of shepherds met in the road, the stare of gypsy women beside a cart in a ditch suckling their children as I shall suckle my children. For soon in the hot midday when the bees hum round the hollyhocks my lover will come. He will stand under the cedar tree. To his one word I shall answer my one word. What has formed in me I shall give him. I shall have children, I shall have maids in aprons, men with pitchforks, a kitchen where they bring the ailing lambs to warm in baskets, where the hams hang and the onions glisten. I shall be like my mother, silent in a blue apron locking up the cupboards. Now I am hungry. I will call my setter. I think of crusts and bread and butter and white plates in a sunny room. I will go back across the fields. I will walk along this grass path with strong, even strides, now swerving to avoid the puddle, now leaping lightly to a clump. Beads of wet form on my rough skirt, my shoes become supple and dark. The stiffness has gone from the day, it is shaded with grey, green and umber. The birds no longer settle on the high road. I return, like a cat or fox returning, whose fur is grey with rime, whose pads are hardened by the coarse earth. I push through the cabbages, making their leaves squeak and their drops spill. I sit waiting for my father's footsteps as he shuffles down the passage pinching some herb between his fingers. I pour out cup after cup while the unopened flowers hold themselves erect on the table among the pots of jam the loaves, and the butter. We are silent. I go then to the cupboard, and take the damp bags of rich sultanas, I lift the heavy flour onto the clean scrubbed kitchen table. I knead, I stretch, I pull, plunging my hands in the warm inwards of the dough. I let the cold water stream fanwise through my fingers. The fire roars, the flies buzz in a circle. All my currants and rices, the silver bags and the blue bags, are locked again in the cupboard. The meat is stood in the oven, the bread rises in a soft dome under the clean towel. I walk in the afternoon down to the river. All the world is breeding. The flies are going from grass to grass. The flowers are thick with pollen. The swans ride the stream in order. The clouds, warm now, sun-spotted, sweep over the hills, leaving gold in the water, and gold on the necks of the swans. Pushing one foot before the other, the cows munch their way across the field. I feel through the grass for the white-domed mushroom, and break its stalk and pick the purple orchid that grows beside it and lay the orchid by the mushroom with the earth at its root, and so home to make the kettle boil for my father among the just reddened roses on the tea table. But evening comes and the lamps are lit. And when evening comes and the lamps are lit they make a yellow fire in the ivy. I sit with my sewing by the table. I think of Ginny, of Rhoda, and hear the rattle of wheels on the pavement as the farm horses plod home, I hear traffic roaring in the evening wind. I look at the quivering leaves in the dark garden and think they dance in London. Ginny kisses Louis Dot. How strange, said Ginny, that people should sleep that people should put out the lights and go upstairs. They have taken off their dresses, they have put on white nightgowns. There are no lights in any of these houses. There is a line of chimney pots against the sky, and a street lamp or two burning, as lamps burn when nobody needs them. The only people in the streets are poor people hurrying. There is no one coming or going in this street, the day is over. A few policemen stand at the corners. Yet night is beginning. I feel myself shining in the dark. Silk is on my knee. My silk legs rub smoothly together. The stones of a necklace lie cold on my throat. My feet feel the pinch of shoes. I sit bolt upright so that my hair may not touch the back of the seat. I am arrayed, I am prepared. This is the momentary pause, the dark moment. The fiddlers have lifted their bows. Now the car slides to a stop. A strip of pavement is lighted. 
The door is opening and shutting. People are arriving, they do not speak, they hasten in. There is the swishing sound of cloaks falling in the hall. This is the prelude, this is the beginning. I glance, I peep, I powder. All is exact, prepared. My hair is swept in one curve. My lips are precisely red. I am ready now to join men and women on the stairs, my peers. I pass them, exposed to their gaze, as they are to mine. Like lightning we look but do not soften or show signs of recognition. Our bodies communicate. This is my calling. This is my world. All is decided and ready, the servants, standing here, and again here, take my name, my fresh, my unknown name, and toss it before me. I enter. Here are gilt chairs in the empty, the expectant rooms, and flowers, stiller, statelier, than flowers that grow, spread green, spread white, against the walls. And on one small table is one bound book. This is what I have dreamt, this is what I have foretold. I am native here. I tread naturally on thick carpets. I slide easily on smooth polished floors, I now begin to unfurl, in this scent, in this radiance, as a fern when its curled leaves unfurl. I stop. I take stock of this world. I look among the groups of unknown people. Among the lustrous green, pink, pale grey women stand upright the bodies of men. They are black and white, they are grooved beneath their clothes with deep rills. I feel again the reflection in the window of the tunnel, it moves. The black and white figures of unknown men look at me as I lean forward, as I turn aside to look at a picture, they turn too. Their hands go fluttering to their ties. They touch their waistcoats, their pocket handkerchiefs. They are very young. They are anxious to make a good impression. I feel a thousand capacities spring up in me. I am arch, gay, languid, melancholy by turns. I am rooted, but I flow. All gold, flowing that way, I say to this one, come. Rippling black, I say to that one, no. One breaks off from his station under the glass cabinet. He approaches. He makes towards me. This is the most exciting moment I have ever known. I flutter. I ripple. I stream like a plant in the river, flowing this way, flowing that way, but rooted, so that he may come to me. Come, I say, come. Pale, with dark hair, the one who is coming is melancholy, romantic. And I am arch and fluent and capricious, for he is melancholy, he is romantic. He is here, he stands at my side. Now with a little jerk, like a limpet broken from a rock, I am broken off, I fall with him, I am carried off. We yield to this slow flood. We go in and out of this hesitating music. Rocks break the current of the dance, it jars, it shivers. In and out, we are swept now into this large figure, it holds us together, we cannot step outside its sinuous, it's hesitating, it's abrupt, it's perfectly encircling walls. Our bodies, his hard, mind flowing, are pressed together within its body, it holds us together, and then lengthening out, in smooth, in sinuous folds, rolls us between it, on and on. Suddenly the music breaks. My blood runs on but my body stands still. The room reels past my eyes. It stops. Come, then, let us wander whirling to the gilt chairs. The body is stronger than I thought. I am dizzier than I supposed. I do not care for anything in the world. I do not care for anybody save this man whose name I do not know. Are we not acceptable, Moon? Are we not lovely sitting together here, I in my satin, he in black and white? My peers may look at me now. I look straight back at you, men and women. I am one of you. This is my world. Now I take this thin-stemmed glass and sip. Wine has a drastic, an astringent taste. I cannot help wincing as I drink. Scent and flowers, radiance and heat are distilled here to a fiery, to a yellow liquid. Just behind my shoulder blade some dry thing, 
wide-eyed, gently closes, gradually lulls itself to sleep. This is rapture, this is relief. The bar at the back of my throat lowers itself. Words crowd and cluster and push forth one on top of another. It does not matter which. They jostle and mount on each other's shoulders. The single and the solitary mate, tumble and become many. It does not matter what I say. Crowding, like a fluttering bird, one sentence crosses the empty space between us. It settles on his lips. I fill my glass again. I drink. The veil drops between us. I am admitted to the warmth and privacy of another soul. We are together, high up, on some alpine pass. He stands melancholy on the crest of the road. I stoop. I pick a blue flower and fix it, standing on tiptoe to reach him, in his coat. There. That is my moment of ecstasy. Now it is over. Now slackness and indifference invade us. Other people brush past. We have lost consciousness of our bodies uniting under the table. I also like fair-haired men with blue eyes. The door opens. The door goes on opening. Now I think, next time it opens the whole of my life will be changed. Who comes? But it is only a servant, bringing glasses. That is an old man, I should be a child with him. That is a great lady, with her I should dissemble. There are girls of my own age, for whom I feel the drawn swords of an honourable antagonism. For these are my peers. I am a native of this world. Here is my risk, here is my adventure. The door opens. Oh come, I say to this one, rippling gold from head to heels. Come, and he comes towards me. I shall edge behind them, said Rhoda, as if I saw someone I know. But I know no one. I shall twitch the curtain and look at the moon. Drafts of oblivion shall quench my agitation. The door opens, the tiger leaps. The door opens, terror rushes in, terror upon terror, pursuing me. Let me visit furtively the treasures I have laid apart. Pools lie on the other side of the world reflecting marble columns. The swallow dips her wing in dark pools. But here the door opens and people come, they come towards me. Throwing faint smiles to mask their cruelty, their indifference, they seize me. The swallow dips her wings, the moon rides through the blue seas alone. I must take his hand, I must answer. But what answer shall I give? I am thrust back to stand burning in this clumsy, this ill-fitting body, to receive the shafts of his indifference and his scorn, I who long for marble columns and pools on the other side of the world where the swallow dips her wings. Night has wheeled a little further over the chimney pots. I see out of the window over his shoulder some unembarrassed cat, not drowned in light, not trapped in silk, free to pause, to stretch, and to move again. I hate all details of the individual life. But I am fixed here to listen. An immense pressure is on me. I cannot move without dislodging the weight of centuries. A million arrows pierce me. Scorn and ridicule pierce me. I, who could beat my breast against the storm and let the hell choke me joyfully, am pinned down here, am exposed. The tiger leaps. Tongues with their whips are upon me. Mobile, incessant, they flicker over me. I must prevaricate and fence them off with lies. What amulet is there against this disaster? What face can I summon to lay cool upon this heat? I think of names on boxes, of mothers from whose wide knee skirts descend, of glades where the menabacked steep hills come down. Hide me, I cry, protect me, for I am the youngest, the most naked of you all. Jimmy rides like a gull on the wave, dealing her looks adroitly here and there, saying this, saying that, with truth. But I lie, I prevaricate. Alone, I rock my basins, I am mistress of my fleet of ships. But here, twisting the tassels of this brocaded curtain in my hostess's window, I am broken into separate pieces, I am no longer one. What then is the knowledge that Ginny has as she dances, the assurance that Susan has as, stooping quietly beneath the lamplight, 
she draws the white cotton through the eye of her needle. They say, yes, they say, no, they bring their fists down with a bang on the table. But I doubt, I tremble, I see the wild thorn tree shake its shadow in the desert. Now I will walk, as if I had an end in view, across the room, to the balcony under the awning. I see the sky, softly feathered with its sudden effulgence of moon. I also see the railings of the square, and two people without faces, leaning like statues against the sky. There is, then, a world immune from change. When I have passed through this drawing room flickering with tongues that cut me like knives, making me stammer, making me lie, I find faces rid of features, robed in beauty. The lovers crouch under the plain tree. The policeman stands sentinel at the corner. A man passes. There is, then, a world immune from change. But I am not composed enough, standing on tiptoe on the verge of fire, still scorched by the hot breath, afraid of the door opening and the leap of the tiger, to make even one sentence. What I say is perpetually contradicted. Each time the door opens I am interrupted. I am not yet twenty-one. I am to be broken. I am to be derided all my life. I am to be cast up and down among these men and women, with their twitching faces, with their lying tongues, like a cork on a rough sea. Like a ribbon of weed I am flung far every time the door opens. I am the foam that sweeps and fills the uttermost rims of the rocks with whiteness, I am also a girl, here in this room. The sun, risen, no longer couched on a green mattress darting a fitful glance through watery jewels, bared its face and looked straight over the waves. They fell with a regular thud. They fell with the concussion of horses' hooves on the turf. Their spray rose like the tossing of lances and assegais over the riders' heads. They swept the beach with steel blue and diamond-tipped water. They drew in and out with the energy, the muscularity, of an engine which sweeps its force out and in again. The sun fell on cornfields and woods, rivers became blue and meniplatted, lawns that sloped down to the water's edge became green as birds' feathers softly ruffling their plumes. The hills, curved and controlled, seemed bound back by thongs, as a limb is laced by muscles, and the woods which bristled proudly on their flanks were like the curt, clipped manet on the neck of a horse. In the garden where the trees stood, thick over flowerbeds, ponds, and greenhouses the birds sang in the hot sunshine, each alone. One sang under the bedroom window, another on the topmost twig of the lilac bush, another on the edge of the wall. Each sang stridently, with passion, with vehemence, as if to let the song burst out of it, no matter if it shattered the song of another bird with harsh discord. Their round eyes bulged with brightness, their claws gripped the twig or rail. They sang, exposed without shelter, to the air and the sun, beautiful in their new plumage, shell-veined or brightly mailed, here barred with soft blues, here splashed with gold, or striped with one bright feather. They sang as if the song were urged out of them by the pressure of the morning. They sang as if the edge of being were sharpened and must cut, must split the softness of the blue-green light, the dampness of the wet earth, the fumes and steams of the greasy kitchen vapour the hot breath of mutton and beef, the richness of pastry and fruit, the damp shreds and peelings thrown from the kitchen bucket, from which a slow steam oozed on the rubbish heap. On all the sodden, the damp spotted, the curled with wetness, they descended, dry-beaked, ruthless, abrupt. They swooped suddenly from the lilac bough or the fence. They spied a snail and tapped the shell against a stone. They tapped furiously, methodically, until the shell broke and something slimy oozed from the crack. They swept and soared sharply in flights high into the air, twittering short, sharp notes, and perched in the upper branches of some tree, and looked down upon leaves and spires beneath, and the country white with blossom, flowing with grass, and the sea which beat like a drum that raises a regiment of plumed and turbaned soldiers. Now and again their songs ran together in swift scales like the interlacings of a mountain stream whose waters, meeting, foam and then mix, and hasten quicker and quicker down the same channel, brushing the same broad leaves. But there is a rock, they sever.
The sun fell in sharp wedges inside the room. Whatever the light touched became dowered with a fanatical existence. A plate was like a white lake. A knife looked like a dagger of ice. Suddenly tumblers revealed themselves upheld by streaks of light. Tables and chairs rose to the surface as if they had been sunk under water and rose, filmed with red, orange, purple like the bloom on the skin of ripe fruit. The veins on the glaze of the china, the grain of the wood, the fibers of the matting became more and more finely engraved. Everything was without shadow. A jar was so green that the eye seemed sucked up through a funnel by its intensity and stuck to it like a limpet. Then shapes took on mass and edge. Here was the boss of a chair, here the bulk of a cupboard. And as the light increased, flocks of shadow were driven before it and conglomerated and hung in many pleated folds in the background. How fair, how strange, said Bernard, glittering, many pointed and many domed London lies before me under mist. Guarded by gasometers, by factory chimneys, she lies sleeping as we approach. She folds the ant heap to her breast. All cries, all clamor, are softly enveloped in silence. Not Rome herself looks more majestic. But we are aimed at her. Already her maternal somnolence is uneasy. Ridges, fledged with houses rise from the mist. Factories, cathedrals, glass domes, institutions, and theatres erect themselves. The early train from the north is hurled at her like a missile. We draw a curtain as we pass. Blank expectant faces stare at us as we rattle and flash through stations. Men clutch their newspapers a little tighter, as our wind sweeps them, envisaging death. But we roar on. We are about to explode in the flanks of the city like a shell in the side of some ponderous, maternal, majestic animal. She hums and murmurs, she awaits us. Meanwhile as I stand looking from the train window, I feel strangely, persuasively, that because of my great happiness, being engaged to be married, I am become part of this speed, this missile hold at the city. I am numb to tolerance and acquiescence. My dear sir, I could say, why do you fidget, taking down your suitcase and pressing into it the cap that you have worn all night? Nothing we can do will avail. Over us all broods a splendid unanimity. We are enlarged and solemnized and brushed into uniformity as with the grey wing of some enormous goose, it is a fine but colourless morning, because we have only one desire, to arrive at the station. I do not want the train to stop with a thud. I do not want the connection which has bound us together sitting opposite each other all night long to be broken. I do not want to feel that hate and rivalry have resumed their sway, and different desires. Our community in the rushing train, sitting together with only one wish, to arrive at Houston, was very welcome. But behold! It is over. We have attained our desire. We have drawn up at the platform. Hurry and confusion and the wish to be first through the gate into the lift assert themselves. But I do not wish to be first through the gate, to assume the burden of individual life. I, who have been since Monday, when she accepted me, charged in every nerve with a sense of identity, who could not see a toothbrush in a glass without saying, my toothbrush, now wish to unclasp my hands and let fall my possessions, and merely stand here in the street, taking no part, watching the omnibuses, without desire, without envy, with what would be boundless curiosity about human destiny if there were any longer an edge to my mind. But it has none. I have arrived, am accepted. I ask nothing. Having dropped off satisfied like a child from the breast, I am at liberty now to sink down, deep, into what passes, this omnipresent, general life. How much, let me note, depends upon trousers, the intelligent head is entirely handicapped by shabby trousers. One observes curious hesitations at the door of the lift. This way, that way, the other. Then individuality asserts itself. They are off. They are all impelled by some necessity. Some miserable affair of keeping an appointment, of buying a hat, severs these beautiful human beings once so united. For myself, I have no aim. I have no ambition. 
I will let myself be carried on by the general impulse. The surface of my mind slips along like a pale grey stream, reflecting what passes. I cannot remember my past, my nose, or the colour of my eyes, or what my general opinion of myself is. Only in moments of emergency, at a crossing, at a curb, the wish to preserve my body springs out and seizes me and stops me, here, before this omnibus. We insist, it seems, on living. Then again, indifference descends. The roar of the traffic, the passage of undifferentiated faces, this way and that way, drugs me into dreams, robs the features from faces. People might walk through me. And, what is this moment of time, this particular day in which I have found myself caught? The growl of traffic might be any uphill, forest trees or the roar of wild beasts. Time has whizzed back an inch or two on its reel, our short progress has been cancelled. I think also that our bodies are in truth naked. We are only lightly covered with buttoned cloth, and beneath these pavements are shells, bones and silence. It is, however, true that my dreaming, my tentative advance like one carried beneath the surface of a stream, is interrupted, torn, pricked and plucked at by sensations, spontaneous and irrelevant, of curiosity, greed, desire, irresponsible as in sleep. I covet that bag etc. No, but I wish to go under, to visit the profound depths, once in a while to exercise my prerogative not always to act, but to explore, to hear vague, ancestral sounds of boughs creaking, of mammoths, to indulge impossible desires to embrace the whole world with the arms of understanding impossible to those who act. Am I not, as I walk, trembling with strange oscillations and vibrations of sympathy, which, unmoored as I am from a private being, bid me embrace these engrossed flocks, these starers and trippers, these errand boys and furtive and fugitive girls who, ignoring their doom, look in at shop windows. But I am aware of our ephemeral passage. It is, however, true that I cannot deny a sense that life for me is now mysteriously prolonged. Is it that I may have children, may cast a fling of seed wider, beyond this generation, this doom-encircled population, shuffling each other in endless competition along the street? My daughters shall come here, in other summers, my sons shall turn new fields. Hence we are not raindrops, soon dried by the wind, we make gardens blow and forests roar, we come up differently, forever and ever. This, then, serves to explain my confidence, my central stability, otherwise so monstrously absurd as I breast the stream of this crowded thoroughfare, making always a passage for myself between people's bodies, taking advantage of safe moments to cross. It is not vanity, for I am emptied of ambition, I do not remember my special gifts, or idiosyncrasy, or the marks I bear on my person, eyes, nose or mouth. I am not, at this moment, myself. Yet behold, it returns. One cannot extinguish that persistent smell. It steals in through some crack in the structure one's identity. I am not part of the street, no, I observe the street. One splits off, therefore. For instance, up that back street a girl stands waiting, for whom? A romantic story. On the wall of that shop is fixed a small crane, and for what reason, I ask, was that crane fixed there? An inventor purple lady swelling, circumambient, hauled from a barouche landor by a perspiring husband sometime in the sixties. A grotesque story. That is, I am a natural coiner of words, a blower of bubbles through one thing and another. And, striking off these observations spontaneously, I elaborate myself, differentiate myself and, listening to the voice that says as I stroll past, look. Take note of that. I conceive myself called upon to provide, some winter's night, a meaning for all my observations a line that runs from one to another, a summing up that completes. But soliloquies in back streets soon pall. I need an audience. That is my downfall. That always ruffles the edge of the final statement and prevents it from forming. I cannot seat myself in some sordid eating house and order the same glass day after day and imbue myself entirely in one fluid, this life. 
I make my phrase and run off with it to some furnished room where it will be lit by dozens of candles. I need eyes on me to draw out these frills and furbelows. To be myself, I note, I need the illumination of other people's eyes, and therefore cannot be entirely sure what is myself. The authentics, like Louis, like Rhoda, exist most completely in solitude. They resent illumination, reduplication. They toss their pictures once painted face downward on the field. On Louis words the ice is packed thick. His words issue pressed, condensed, enduring. I wish, then, after this somnolence to sparkle, men of seat under the light of my friends' faces. I have been traversing the sunless territory of non-identity. A strange land. I have heard in my moment of appeasement, in my moment of obliterating satisfaction, the sigh, as it goes in, comes out, of the tide that draws beyond this circle of bright light, this drumming of insensate fury. I have had one moment of enormous peace. This perhaps is happiness. Now I am drawn back by pricking sensations, by curiosity, greed, I am hungry, and the irresistible desire to be myself. I think of people to whom I could say things, Louis, Neville, Susan, Ginny and Rhoda. With them I am menacided. They retrieve me from darkness. We shall meet tonight, thank heaven. Thank heaven, I need not be alone. We shall dine together. We shall say goodbye to Percival, who goes to India. The hour is still distant, but I feel already those harbingers, those outriders, figures of one's friends in absence. I see Louis, stone-carved, sculpturesque, Neville, scissor-cutting, exact, Susan with eyes like lumps of crystal, Jimmy dancing like a flame, febrile, hot, over dry earth, and Rhoda the nymph of the fountain always wet. These are fantastic pictures, these are figments, these visions of friends in absence, grotesque, dropsical, vanishing at the first touch of the toe of a real boot. Yet they drum me alive. They brush off these vapors. I begin to be impatient of solitude to feel its draperies hang sweltering, unwholesome about me. Oh, to toss them off and be active. Anybody will do. I am not fastidious. The crossing sweeper will do, the postman, the waiter in this French restaurant, better still the genial proprietor, whose geniality seems reserved for oneself. He mixes the salad with his own hands for some privileged guest. Which is the privileged guest, I ask, and why? And what is he saying to the lady in earrings, is she a friend or a customer? I feel at once, as I sit down at a table, the delicious jostle of confusion, of uncertainty, of possibility, of speculation. Images breed instantly. I am embarrassed by my own fertility. I could describe every chair, table, luncher here copiously, freely. My mind hums hither and thither with its veil of words for everything. To speak, about wine even to the waiter, is to bring about an explosion. Up goes the rocket. Its golden grain falls, fertilizing, upon the rich soil of my imagination. The entirely unexpected nature of this explosion, that is the joy of intercourse. I, mixed with an unknown Italian waiter, what am I? There is no stability in this world. Who is to say what meaning there is in anything? Who is to foretell the flight of a word? It is a balloon that sails over treetops. To speak of knowledge is futile. All is experiment and adventure. We are forever mixing ourselves with unknown quantities. What is to come? I know not. But as I put down my glass I remember, I am engaged to be married. I am to dine with my friends tonight. I am Bernard, myself. It is now five minutes to eight, said Neville. I have come early. I have taken my place at the table ten minutes before the time in order to taste every moment of anticipation, to see the door open and to say, is it Percival? No, it is not Percival. There is a morbid pleasure in saying, no, it is not Percival. I have seen the door open and shut twenty times already, 
each time the suspense sharpens. This is the place to which he is coming. This is the table at which he will sit. Here, incredible as it seems, will be his actual body. This table, these chairs, this metal vase with its three red flowers are about to undergo an extraordinary transformation. Already the room, with its swing doors, its tables heaped with fruit, with cold joints, wears the wavering, unreal appearance of a place where one waits expecting something to happen. Things quiver as if not yet in being. The blankness of the white tablecloth glares. The hostility, the indifference of other people dining here is oppressive. We look at each other, see that we do not know each other, stare, and go off. Such looks are lashes. I feel the whole cruelty and indifference of the world in them. If he should not come I could not bear it. I should go. Yet somebody must be seeing him now. He must be in some cab, he must be passing some shop. And every moment he seems to pump into this room this prickly light, this intensity of being, so that things have lost their normal uses, this knife blade is only a flash of light, not a thing to cut with. The normal is abolished. The door opens, but he does not come. That is Louis hesitating there. That is his strange mixture of assurance and timidity. He looks at himself in the looking glass as he comes in, he touches his hair, he is dissatisfied with his appearance. He says, I am a duke, the last of an ancient race. He is acrid, suspicious, domineering, difficult, I am comparing him with Percival. At the same time he is formidable, for there is laughter in his eyes. He has seen me. Here he is. There is Susan, said Louis. She does not see us. She has not dressed, because she despises the futility of London. She stands for a moment at the swing door, looking about her like a creature dazed by the light of a lamp. Now she moves. She has the stealthy yet assured movements, even among tables and chairs, of a wild beast. She seems to find her way by instinct in and out among these little tables, touching no one, disregarding waiters, yet comes straight to our table in the corner. When she sees us, Neville, and myself, her face assumes a certainty which is alarming, as if she had what she wanted. To be loved by Susan would be to be impaled by a bird's sharp beak, to be nailed to a barnyard door. Yet there are moments when I could wish to be speared by a beak, to be nailed to a barnyard door, positively, once and for all. Rhoda comes now, from nowhere, having slipped in while we were not looking. She must have made a tortuous course, taking cover now behind a waiter, now behind some ornamental pillar, so as to put off as long as possible the shock of recognition, so as to be secure for one more moment to rock her petals in her basin. We wake her. We torture her. She dreads us, she despises us, yet comes cringing to our sides because for all our cruelty there is always some name, some face, which sheds a radiance, which lights up her pavements and makes it possible for her to replenish her dreams. The door opens, the door goes on opening, said Neville, yet he does not come. There is Ginny, said Susan. She stands in the door. Everything seems stayed. The waiter stops. The diners at the table by the door look. She seems to center everything, round her tables, lines of doors, windows, ceilings, ray themselves, like rays round the star in the middle of a smashed window pane. She brings things to a point, to order. Now she sees us, and moves, and all the rays ripple and flow and waver over us, bringing in new tides of sensation. We change. Louis puts his hand to his tie. Neville, who sits waiting with agonized intensity, nervously straightens the forks in front of him. Rhoda sees her with surprise, as if on some far horizon a fire blazed. And I, though I pile my mind with damp grass, with wet fields, with the sound of rain on the roof and the gusts of wind that batter at the house in winter and so protect my soul against her, feel her derision steal round me, feel her laughter curl its tongues of fire round me and light up unsparingly my shabby dress, my square-tipped fingernails, which I at once hide under the tablecloth. He has not come, 
said Neville. The door opens and he does not come. That is Bernard. As he pulls off his coat he shows, of course, the blue shirt under his armpits. And then, unlike the rest of us, he comes in without pushing open a door, without knowing that he comes into a room full of strangers. He does not look in the glass. His hair is untidy, but he does not know it. He has no perception that we differ, or that this table is his goal. He hesitates on his way here. Who is that? He asks himself, as he half knows a woman in an opera cloak. He half knows everybody, he knows nobody, I compare him with Percival. But now, perceiving us, he waves a benevolent salute, he bears down with such benignity, with such love of mankind, crossed with humor at the futility of loving mankind, that, if it were not for Percival, who turns all this to vapor, one would feel, as the others already feel, now is our festival, now we are together. But without Percival there is no solidity. We are silhouettes, hollow phantoms moving mistily without a background. The swing door goes on opening, said Rhoda. Strangers keep on coming, people we shall never see again, people who brush us disagreeably with their familiarity, their indifference, and the sense of a world continuing without us. We cannot sink down, we cannot forget our faces. Even I who have no face, who make no difference when I come in, Susan and Ginny change bodies and faces, flutter unattached, without anchorage anywhere, unconsolidated, incapable of composing any blankness or continuity or wall against which these bodies move. It is because of Neville and his misery. The sharp breath of his misery scatters my being. Nothing can settle, nothing can subside. Every time the door opens he looks fixedly at the table, he dare not raise his eyes, then looks for one second and says, he has not come. But here he is. Now, said Neville, my tree flowers. My heart rises. All oppression is relieved. All impediment is removed. The reign of chaos is over. He has imposed order. Knives cut again. Here is Percival, said Ginny. He has not dressed. Here is Percival, said Bernard, smoothing his hair, not from vanity, he does not look in the glass, but to propitiate the god of decency. He is conventional, he is a hero. The little boys trooped after him across the playing fields. They blew their noses as he blew his nose, but unsuccessfully, for he is Percival. Now, when he is about to leave us, to go to India, all these trifles come together. He is a hero. Oh yes, that is not to be denied, and when he takes his seat by Susan, whom he loves, the occasion is crowned. We who yelped like jackals biting at each other's heels now assume the sober and confident air of soldiers in the presence of their captain. We who have been separated by our youth, the oldest is not yet twenty-five, who have sung like eager birds each his own song and tapped with the remorseless and savage egotism of the young our own snail shell till it cracked, I am engaged, or perched solitary outside some bedroom window and sang of love, of fame and other single experiences so dear to the callow bird with a yellow tuft on its beak, now come nearer, and shuffling closer on our perch in this restaurant where everybody's interests are at variance, and the incessant passage of traffic chafes us with distractions, and the door opening perpetually its glass cage solicits us with myriad temptations and offers insults and wounds to our confidence, sitting together here we love each other and believe in our own endurance. Now let us issue from the darkness of solitude, said Louis. Now let us say, brutally and directly, what is in our minds, said Neville. Our isolation, our preparation, is over. The furtive days of secrecy and hiding, the revelations on staircases, moments of terror and ecstasy. Old Mrs. Constable lifted her sponge and warmth poured over us, said Bernard. We became clothed in this changing, this feeling garment of flesh. The boot boy made love to the scullery maid in the kitchen garden, said Susan, among the blown out washing. The breath of the wind was like a tiger panting, 
said Rhoda. The man lay livid with his throat cut in the gutter, said Neville. And going upstairs I could not raise my foot against the immitigable apple tree with its silver leaves held stiff. The leaf danced in the hedge without anyone to blow it, said Ginny. In the sun-baked corner, said Louis, the petals swam on depths of green. At Elverdon the gardeners swept and swept with their great brooms, and the woman sat at a table writing, said Bernard. From these close-fold balls of string we draw now every filament, said Louis, remembering, when we meet. And then, said Bernard, the cap came to the door, and, pressing our new bowler hats tightly over our eyes to hide our unmanly tears, we drove through streets in which even the housemaids looked at us, and our names painted in white letters on our boxes proclaimed to all the world that we were going to school with the regulation number of socks and drawers, on which our mothers for some nights previously had stitched our initials, in our boxes. A second severance from the body of our mother. And Miss Lambert, Miss Cutting and Miss Bard, said Ginny, monumental ladies, white ruffed, stone coloured, enigmatic, with amethyst rings moving like virginal tapers, dim glowworms over the pages of French, geography and arithmetic, presided, and there were maps, green baize boards, and rows of shoes on a shelf. Bells rang punctually, said Susan, maids scuffled and giggled. There was a drawing in of chairs and a drawing out of chairs on the linoleum. But from one attic there was a blue view, a distant view of a field unstained by the corruption of this regimented, unreal existence. Down from our heads veils fell, said Rhoda. We clasped the flowers with their green leaves rustling in garlands. We changed, we became unrecognizable, said Louis. Exposed to all these different lights, what we had in us, for we are all so different, came intermittently, in violent patches, spaced by blank voids, to the surface as if some acid had dropped unequally on the plate. I was this, Neville that, Rhoda different again, and Bernard too. Then canoes slipped through palely tinted yellow branches, said Neville, and Bernard, advancing in his casual way against breadths of green, against houses of very ancient foundation, tumbled in a heap on the ground beside me. In an access of emotion, winds are not more raving, nor lightning more sudden, I took my poem, I flung my poem, I slammed the door behind me. I, however, said Louis, losing sight of you, sat in my office and tore the date from the calendar, and announced to the world of shipbrokers, corn chandlers, and actuaries that Friday the 10th, or Tuesday the 18th, had dawned on the city of London. Then, said Ginny, Rhoda, and I, exposed in bright dresses, with a few precious stones nestling on a cold ring round our throats, bowed, shook hands and took a sandwich from a plate with a smile. The tiger leapt, and the swallow dipped her wings in dark pools on the other side of the world, said Rhoda. But here and now we are together, said Bernard. We have come together, at a particular time, to this particular spot. We are drawn into this communion by some deep, some common emotion. Shall we call it, conveniently, love? Shall we say love of Percival because Percival is going to India? No, that is too small, too particular a name. We cannot attach the width and spread of our feelings to so small a mark. We have come together, from the north, from the south, from Susan's farm, from Louis House of Business, to make one thing, not enduring, for what endures. But seen by many eyes simultaneously. There is a red carnation in that vase. A single flower as we sat here waiting, but now a seven-sided flower, menopetaled, red, puce, purple-shaded, stiff with silver-tinted leaves, a whole flower to which every eye brings its own contribution. 
After the capricious fires, the abysmal dullness of youth, said Neville, the light falls upon real objects now. Here are knives and forks. The world is displayed, and we too, so that we can talk. We differ, it may be too profoundly, said Louis, for explanation. But let us attempt it. I smoothed my hair when I came in, hoping to look like the rest of you. But I cannot, for I am not single and entire as you are. I have lived a thousand lives already. Every day I unbury, I dig up. I find relics of myself in the sand that women made thousands of years ago, when I heard songs by the Nile and the chained beasts stamping. What you see beside you, this man, this Louis, is only the cinders and refuse of something once splendid. I was an Arab prince, behold my free gestures. I was a great poet in the time of Elizabeth. I was a duke at the court of Louis XIV. I am very vain, very confident, I have an immeasurable desire that women should sigh in sympathy. I have eaten no lunch today in order that Susan may think me cadaverous and that Ginny may extend to me the exquisite balm of her sympathy. But while I admire Susan and Percival, I hate the others, because it is for them that I do these antics, smoothing my hair, concealing my accent. I am the little ape who chatters over a nut, and you are the dowdy women with shiny bags of stale buns, I am also the caged tiger, and you are the keepers with red-hot bars. That is, I am fiercer and stronger than you are, yet the apparition that appears above ground after ages of nonentity will be spent in terror lest you should laugh at me, in veerings with the wind against the soot storms, in efforts to make a steel ring of clear poetry that shall connect the gulls and the women with bad teeth, the church spire and the bobbing billycock hats as I see them when I take my luncheon and prop my poet is it Lucretius? Against a cruet and the gravest splashed bill of fare. But you will never hate me, said Ginny. You will never see me, even across a room full of gilt chairs and ambassadors, without coming to me across the room to seek my sympathy. When I came in just now everything stood still in a pattern. Waiters stopped, diners raised their forks and held them. I had the air of being prepared for what would happen. When I sat down you put your hands to your ties, you hid them under the table. But I hide nothing. I am prepared. Every time the door opens I cry more. But my imagination is the body's. I can imagine nothing beyond the circle cast by my body. My body goes before me, like a lantern down a dark lane, bringing one thing after another out of darkness into a ring of light. I dazzle you, I make you believe that this is all. But when you stand in the door, said Neville, you inflict stillness, demanding admiration, and that is a great impediment to the freedom of intercourse. You stand in the door making us notice you. But none of you saw me approach. I came early, I came quickly and directly, here, to sit by the person whom I love. My life has a rapidity that yours lack. I am like a hound on the scent. I hunt from dawn to dusk. Nothing, not the pursuit of perfection through the sand, nor fame, nor money, has meaning for me. I shall have riches, I shall have fame. But I shall never have what I want, for I lack bodily grace and the courage that comes with it. The swiftness of my mind is too strong for my body. I fail before I reach the end and fall in a heap, damp, perhaps disgusting. I excite pity in the crises of life, not love. Therefore I suffer horribly. But I do not suffer, as Louis does, to make myself a spectacle. I have too fine a sense of fact to allow myself these juggleries, these pretenses. I see everything except one thing, with complete clarity. That is my saving. That is what gives my suffering an unceasing excitement. That is what makes me dictate, even when I am silent. And since I am, in one respect, deluded, since the person is always changing, though not the desire, and I do not know in the morning by whom I shall sit at night, I am never stagnant, I rise from my worst disasters, I turn, I change. Pebbles bounce off the mail of my muscular, my extended body. In this pursuit I shall grow old. If I could believe, said Rhoda, that I should grow old in pursuit and change, I should be rid of my fear, 
nothing persists. One moment does not lead to another. The door opens and the tiger leaps. You did not see me come. I circled round the chairs to avoid the horror of the spring. I am afraid of you all. I am afraid of the shock of sensation that leaps upon me, because I cannot deal with it as you do, I cannot make one moment merge in the next. To me they are all violent, all separate, and if I fall under the shock of the leap of the moment you will be on me, tearing me to pieces. I have no end in view. I do not know how to run minute to minute and hour to hour, solving them by some natural force until they make the whole an indivisible mass that you call life. Because you have an end in view, one person, is it, to sit beside, an idea is it, your beauty is it? I do not know, your days and hours pass like the boughs of forest trees and the smooth green of forest rides to a hound running on the scent. But there is no single scent, no single body for me to follow. And I have no face. I am like the foam that races over the beach or the moonlight that falls are like here on a tin can, here on a spike of the mailed sea holly, or a bone or a half-eaten boat. I am well down caverns, and flap like paper against endless corridors, and must press my hand against the wall to draw myself back. But since I wish above all things to have lodgment, I pretend, as I go upstairs lagging behind Ginny and Susan, to have an end in view. I pull on my stockings as I see them pull on theirs. I wait for you to speak and then speak like you. I am drawn here across London to a particular spot, to a particular place, not to see you or you or you, but to light my fire at the general blaze of you who live wholly, indivisibly and without caring. When I came into the room tonight, said Susan, I stopped, I peered about like an animal with its eyes near to the ground. The smell of carpets and furniture and scent disgusts me. I like to walk through the wet fields alone, or to stop at a gate and watch my setter nose in a circle, and to ask, where is the hair? I like to be with people who twist herbs, and spit into the fire, and shuffle down long passages in slippers like my father. The only sayings I understand are cries of love, hate, rage and pain. This talking is undressing an old woman whose dress had seemed to be part of her, but now, as we talk, she turns pinkish underneath, and has wrinkled thighs and sagging breasts. When you are silent you are again beautiful. I shall never have anything but natural happiness. It will almost content me. I shall go to bed tired. I shall lie like a field bearing crops in rotation, in the summer heat will dance over me, in the winter I shall be cracked with the cold. But heat and cold will follow each other naturally without my willing or unwilling. My children will carry me on, their teething, their crying, their going to school and coming back will be like the waves of the sea under me. No day will be without its movement. I shall be lifted higher than any of you on the backs of the seasons. I shall possess more than Ginny, more than Rhoda, by the time I die. But on the other hand, where you are various and dimple a million times to the ideas and laughter of others, I shall be sullen, storm-tinted and all one purple. I shall be debased and hidebound by the bestial and beautiful passion of maternity. I shall push the fortunes of my children unscrupulously. I shall hate those who see their faults. I shall lie basely to help them. I shall let them wall me away from you, from you, and from you. Also, I am torn with jealousy. I hate Ginny because she shows me that my hands are red, my nails bitten. I love with such ferocity that it kills me when the object of my love shows by a phrase that he can escape. He escapes, and I am left clutching at a string that slips in and out among the leaves on the treetops. I do not understand phrases. Had I been born, said Bernard, not knowing that one word follows another I might have been, who knows, perhaps anything. As it is, finding sequences everywhere, I cannot bear the pressure of solitude. When I cannot see words curling like rings of smoke round me I am in darkness, I am nothing. When I am alone I fall into lethargy, and say to myself dismally as I poke the cinders through the bars of the grate, Mrs. Moffat will come. She will come and sweep it all up. 
When Louis is alone he sees with astonishing intensity, and will write some words that may outlast us all. Rhoda loves to be alone. She fears us because we shatter the sense of being which is so extreme in solitude, see how she grasps her fork, her weapon against us. But I only come into existence when the plumber, or the horse dealer, or however it may be, says something which sets me alight. Then how lovely the smoke of my phrase is, rising and falling, flaunting and falling, upon red lobsters and yellow fruit, wreathing them into one beauty. But observe how meretricious the phrase is, made up of what evasions and old lies. Thus my character is in part made of the stimulus which other people provide, and is not mine, as yours are. There is some fatal streak, some wandering and irregular vein of silver, weakening it. Hence the fact that used to enrage Neville at school, that I left him. I went with the boasting boys with little caps and badges, driving off in big breaks, there are some here tonight, dining together, correctly dressed, before they go off in perfect concord to the music hall, I love them. For they bring me into existence as certainly as you do. Hence, too, when I am leaving you and the train is going, you feel that it is not the train that is going, but I, Bernard, who does not care, who does not feel, who has no ticket, and has lost perhaps his purse. Susan, staring at the string that slips in and out among the leaves of the beech trees, cries, he is gone. He has escaped me. For there is nothing to lay hold of. I am made and remade continually. Different people draw different words from me. Thus there is not one person but fifty people whom I want to sit beside tonight. But I am the only one of you who is at home here without taking liberties. I am not gross, I am not a snob. If I lie open to the pressure of society I often succeed with the dexterity of my tongue in putting something difficult into the currency. See my little toys, twisted out of nothing in a second, how they entertain. I am no hoarder, I shall leave only a cupboard of old clothes when I die, and I am almost indifferent to the minor vanities of life which cause Louis so much torture. But I have sacrificed much. Veined as I am with iron, with silver, and streaks of common mud, I cannot contract into the firm fist which those clench who do not depend upon stimulus. I am incapable of the denials, the heroisms of Louis and Rhoda. I shall never succeed, even in talk. In making a perfect phrase. But I shall have contributed more to the passing moment than any of you, I shall go into more rooms, more different rooms, than any of you. But because there is something that comes from outside and not from within I shall be forgotten, when my voice is silent you will not remember me, save as the echo of a voice that once read the fruit into phrases. Look, said Rhoda, listen. Look how the light becomes richer, second by second, and bloom and ripeness lie everywhere, and our eyes, as they range round this room with all its tables, seem to push through curtains of colour, red, orange, umber and queer ambiguous tints, which yield like veils and close behind them, and one thing melts into another. Yes, said Ginny, our senses have widened. Membranes, webs of nerve that lay white and limp, have filled and spread themselves and float round us like filaments, making the air tangible and catching in them faraway sounds unheard before. The roar of London, said Louis, is round us. Motorcars, vans, omnibuses pass and repass continuously. All are merged in one turning wheel of single sound. All separate sounds, wheels, bells, the cries of drunkards, of merrymakers, are churned into one sound, steel blue, circular. Then a siren hoots. At that shore slip away, chimneys flatten themselves, the ship makes for the open sea. Percival is going, said Neville. We sit here, surrounded, lit up, many coloured, all things, hands, curtains, knives, and forks, other people dining run into each other. We are walled in here. But India lies outside. I see India, said Bernard. I see the low, long shore, I see the tortuous lanes of stamped mud that lead in and out among ramshackle pagodas, I see the gilt and crenellated buildings which have an air of fragility and decay as if they were temporarily run up buildings in some oriental exhibition. 
I see a pair of bullocks who drag a low cart along the sun-baked road. The cart sways incompetently from side to side. Now one wheel sticks in the rut, and at once innumerable natives in loincloths swarm round it, chattering excitedly. But they do nothing. Time seems endless, ambition vain. Over all broods a sense of the uselessness of human exertion. There are strange sour smells. An old man in a ditch continues to chew beetle and to contemplate his navel. But now, behold, Percival advances, Percival rides a flea-bitten mare, and wears a sun helmet. By applying the standards of the West, by using the violent language that is natural to him, the bullock cart is righted in less than five minutes. The Oriental problem is solved. He rides on, the multitude cluster round him, regarding him as if he were what indeed he is a god. Unknown, with or without a secret, it does not matter, said Rhoda, he is like a stone fallen into a pond round which minnows swarm. Like minnows, we who had been shooting this way, that way, all shot round him when he came. Like minnows, conscious of the presence of a great stone, we undulate and eddy contentedly. Comfort steals over us. Gold runs in our blood. One, two, one, two, the heart beats in serenity, in confidence, in some trance of well-being, in some rapture of benignity, and look, the outermost parts of the earth, pale shadows on the utmost horizon, India for instance, rise into our purview. The world that had been shriveled, rounds itself, remote provinces are fetched up out of darkness, we see muddy roads, twisted jungle, swarms of men, and the vulture that feeds on some bloated carcass as within our scope, part of our proud and splendid province, since Percival, riding alone on a flea-bitten mare, advances down a solitary path, has his camp pitched among desolate trees, and sits alone, looking at the enormous mountains. It is Percival, said Louis, sitting silent as he sat among the tickling grasses when the breeze parted the clouds and they formed again, who makes us aware that these attempts to say, I am this, I am that, which we make, coming together, like separated parts of one body and soul, are false. Something has been left out from fear. Something has been altered, from vanity. We have tried to accentuate differences. From the desire to be separate we have laid stress upon our faults, and what is particular to us. But there is a chain whirling round, round, in a steel blue circle beneath. It is hate, it is love, said Susan. That is the furious coal black stream that makes us dizzy if we look down into it. We stand on a ledge here, but if we look down we turn giddy. It is love, said Ginny, it is hate, such as Susan feels for me because I kissed Louis once in the garden, because equipped as I am, I make her think when I come in, my hands are red, and hide them. But our hatred is almost indistinguishable from our love. Yet these roaring waters, said Neville, upon which we build our crazy platforms are more stable than the wild, the weak and inconsequent cries that we utter when trying to speak, we rise, when we reason and jerk out these false sayings, I am this, I am that. Speech is false. But I eat. I gradually lose all knowledge of particulars as I eat. I am becoming weighed down with food. These delicious mouthfuls of roast duck, fitly piled with vegetables, following each other in exquisite rotation of warmth, weight, sweet and bitter, past my palate, down my gullet, into my stomach, have stabilized my body. I feel quiet, gravity, control. All is solid now. Instinctively my palate now requires and anticipates sweetness and lightness, something sugared and evanescent, and cool wine, fitting glove-like over those finer nerves that seem to tremble from the roof of my mouth and make it spread, as I drink, into a domed cavern, green with vine leaves, musk-scented, purple with grapes. Now I can look steadily into the mill race that foams beneath. By what particular name are we to call it? Let Rhoda speak, whose face I see reflected mistily in the looking glass opposite, 
Rhoda whom I interrupted when she rocked her petals in a brown basin, asking for the pocket knife that Bernard had stolen. Love is not a whirlpool to her. She is not giddy when she looks down. She looks far away over our heads, beyond India. Yes, between your shoulders, over your heads, to a landscape, said Rhoda, to a hollow where the menabacked steep hills come down like birds' wings folded. There, on the short, firm turf, are bushes, dark-leaved, and against their darkness I see a shape, white, but not of stone, moving, perhaps alive. But it is not you, it is not you, it is not you, not Percival, Susan, Ginny, Neville or Louis. When the white arm rests upon the knee it is a triangle, now it is upright a column, now a fountain, falling. It makes no sign, it does not beckon, it does not see us. Behind it rules the sea. It is beyond our reach. Yet there I venture. There I go to replenish my emptiness, to stretch my nights and fill them fuller and fuller with dreams. And for a second even now, even here, I reach my object and say, wander no more. All else is trial and make-believe. Here is the end. But these pilgrimages, these moments of departure, start always in your presence, from this table, these lights from Percival and Susan, here and now. Always I see the grove over your heads, between your shoulders, or from a window when I have crossed the room at a party and stand looking down into the street. But his slippers, said Neville, and his voice downstairs in the hall, and catching sight of him when he does not see one. One waits and he does not come. It gets later and later. He has forgotten. He is with someone else. He is faithless, his love meant nothing. Oh, then the agony, then the intolerable despair. And then the door opens. He is here. Ripping gold, I say to him, come, said Ginny. And he comes, he crosses the room to where I sit, with my dress like a veil billowing round me on the gilt chair. Our hands touch, our bodies burst into fire. The chair, the cup, the table, nothing remains unlit. All quivers, all kindles, all burns clear. Look, Rhoda, said Louis, they have become nocturnal, wrapped. Their eyes are like moths' wings moving so quickly that they do not seem to move at all. Horns and trumpets, said Rhoda, ring out. Leaves unfold, the stags blare in the thicket. There is a dancing and a drumming, like the dancing and the drumming of naked men with assegais. Like the dance of savages, said Louis, round the campfire. They are savage, they are ruthless. They dance in a circle, flapping bladders. The flames leap over their painted faces, over the leopard skins and the bleeding limbs which they have torn from the living body. The flames of the festival rise high, said Rhoda. The great procession passes, flinging green boughs and flowering branches. Their horns spill blue smoke, their skins are dappled red and yellow in the torchlight. They throw violets. They deck the beloved with garlands and with laurel leaves, they're on the ring of turf where the steep-backed hills come down. The procession passes. And while it passes, Louis, we are aware of downfalling, we forebode decay. The shadow slants. We who are conspirators, withdrawn together to lean over some cold urn, note how the purple flame flows downwards. Death is woven in with the violets, said Louis. Death and again death. How proudly we sit here, said Ginny, we who are not yet twenty-five. Outside the trees flower, outside the women linger, outside the cabs swerve and sweep. Emerged from the tentative ways, the obscurities, and dazzle of youth, we look straight in front of us, ready for what may come, the door opens, the door keeps on opening. All is real, all is firm without shadow or illusion. Beauty rides our brows. There is mine, there is Susan's. Our flesh is firm and cool. Our differences are clear-cut as the shadows of rocks in full sunlight. Beside us lie crisp rolls, yellow-glazed, and hard, the tablecloth is white, 
and our hands lie half curled, ready to contract. Days and days are to come, winter days, summer days, we have scarcely broken into our hoard. Now the fruit is swollen beneath the leaf. The rim is golden, and I say to him, come dot. He has red ears, said Louis, and the smell of meat hangs down in a damp net while the city clerks take snacks at the lunch bar. With infinite time before us, said Neville, we ask what shall we do? Shall we loiter down Bond Street, looking here and there, and buying perhaps a fountain pen because it is green, or asking how much is the ring with the blue stone? Or shall we sit indoors and watch the coals turn crimson? Shall we stretch our hands for books and read here a passage and there a passage? Shall we shout with laughter for no reason? Shall we push through flowering meadows and make daisy chains? Shall we find out when the next train starts for the Hebrides and engage a reserved compartment? All is to come. For you, said Bernard, but yesterday I walked bang into a pillar box. Yesterday I became engaged. How strange, said Susan, the little heaps of sugar look by the side of our plates. Also the mottled peelings of pears, and the plush rims to the looking glasses. I had not seen them before. Everything is now set, everything is fixed. Bernard is engaged. Something irrevocable has happened. A circle has been cast on the waters, a chain is imposed. We shall never flow freely again. For one moment only, said Louis. Before the chain breaks, before disorder returns, see us fixed, see us displayed, see us held in a vice. But now the circle breaks. Now the current flows. Now we rush faster than before. Now passions that lay in wait down there in the dark weeds which grow at the bottom rise and pound us with their waves. Pain and jealousy, envy and desire, and something deeper than they are, stronger than love and more subterranean. The voice of action speaks. Listen, Rhoda, for we are conspirators, with our hands on the cold urn, to the casual, quick, exciting voice of action of hounds running on the scent. They speak now without troubling to finish their sentences. They talk a little language such as lovers use. An imperious brute possesses them. The nerves thrill in their thighs. Their hearts pound and churn in their sides. Susan screws her pocket handkerchief. Ginny's eyes dance with fire. They are immune, said Rhoda from picking fingers and searching eyes. How easily they turn and glance, what poses they take of energy and pride. What life shines in Ginny's eyes, how fell, how entire Susan's glance is, searching for insects at the roots. Their hair shines lustrous. Their eyes burn like the eyes of animals brushing through leaves on the scent of the prey. The circle is destroyed. We are thrown asunder. But soon, too soon, said Bernard, this egotistic exaltation fails. Too soon the moment of ravenous identity is over, and the appetite for happiness, and happiness, and still more happiness is glutted. The stone is sunk, the moment is over. Round me there spreads a wide margin of indifference. Now open in my eyes a thousand eyes of curiosity. Anyone now is at liberty to murder Bernard, who is engaged to be married, so long as they leave untouched this margin of unknown territory, this forest of the unknown world. Why, I ask, whispering discreetly, do women dine alone together there? Who are they? And what has brought them on this particular evening to this particular spot? The youth in the corner, judging from the nervous way in which he puts his hand from time to time to the back of his head, is from the country. He is suppliant, and so anxious to respond suitably to the kindness of his father's friend, his host, that he can scarcely enjoy now what he will enjoy very much at about half past eleven tomorrow morning. I have also seen that lady powder her nose three times in the midst of an absorbing conversation about love, perhaps, about the unhappiness of their dearest friend perhaps. Ah, but the state of my nose, she thinks, and out comes her powder puff, obliterating in its passage all the most fervent feelings of the human heart. 
There remains, however, the insoluble problem of the solitary man with the eyeglass, of the elderly lady drinking champagne alone. Who and what are these unknown people? I ask. I could make a dozen stories of what he said, of what she said I can see a dozen pictures. But what are stories? Toys I twist, bubbles I blow, one ring passing through another. And sometimes I begin to doubt if there are stories. What is my story? What is Rhoda's? What is Neville's? There are facts, as, for example, the handsome young man in the grey suit, whose reserve contrasted so strangely with the loquacity of the others, now brushed the crumbs from his waistcoat and, with a characteristic gesture at once commanding and benign, made a sign to the waiter, who came instantly and returned a moment later with the bill discreetly folded upon a plate. That is the truth, that is a fact, but beyond it all is darkness and conjecture. Now once more, said Louis, as we are about to part, having paid our bill, the circle in our blood, broken so often, so sharply, for we are so different, closes in a ring. Something is made. Yes, as we rise and fidget, a little nervously, we pray, holding in our hands this common feeling, do not move, do not let the swing door cut to pieces the thing that we have made, that globes itself here, among these lights, these peelings, this litter of bread crumbs and people passing. Do not move, do not go. Hold it forever. Let us hold it for one moment, said Ginny, love, hatred, by whatever name we call it, this globe whose walls are made of Percival, of youth and beauty, and something so deep sunk within us that we shall perhaps never make this moment out of one man again. Forests and far countries on the other side of the world, said Rhoda, are in it, seas and jungles, the howlings of jackals and moonlight falling upon some high peak where the eagle soars. Happiness is in it, said Neville, and the quiet of ordinary things. A table, a chair, a book with a paper knife stuck between the pages. And the petal falling from the rose, and the light flickering as we sit silent, or, perhaps, bethinking us of some trifle, suddenly speak. Weekdays are in it, said Susan, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the horses going up to the fields and the horses returning, the rooks rising and falling, and catching the elm trees in their net, whether it is April, whether it is November. What is to come is in it, said Bernard. That is the last drop and the brightest that we let fall like some supernal quicksilver into the swelling and splendid moment created by us from Percival. What is to come? I ask, brushing the crumbs from my waistcoat, what is outside? We have proved, sitting eating, sitting talking, that we can add to the treasury of moments. We are not slaves bound to suffer incessantly unrecorded petty blows on our bent backs. We are not sheep either, following a master. We are creators. We too have made something that will join the innumerable congregations of past time. We too, as we put on our hats and push open the door, stride not into chaos, but into a world that our own force can subjugate and make part of the illumined and everlasting road. Look, Percival, while they fetch the taxi, at the prospect which you are so soon to lose. The street is hard and burnished with the churning of innumerable wheels. The yellow canopy of our tremendous energy hangs like a burning cloth above our heads. Theatres, music halls and lamps in private houses make that light. Peaked clouds, said Rhoda, voyage over a sky dark like polished whalebone. Now the agony begins, now the horror has seized me with its fangs, said Neville. Now the cap comes, now Percival goes. What can we do to keep him? How bridge the distance between us? How fan the fire so that it blazes forever? How signal to all time to come that we, who stand in the street, in the lamplight, loved Percival. Now Percival is gone. The sun had risen to its full height. It was no longer half seen and guessed at, from hints and gleams, 
as if a girl couched on her green sea mattress tired her brows with water-globed jewels that sent lances of opal-tinted light falling and flashing in the uncertain air like the flanks of a dolphin leaping, or the flash of a falling blade. Now the sun burnt uncompromising, undeniable. It struck upon the hard sand, and the rocks became furnaces of red heat, it searched each pool and caught the minnow hiding in the cranny, and showed the rusty cart wool, the white bone, or the boot without laces stuck, black as iron, in the sand. It gave to everything its exact measure of color, to the sand hills their innumerable glitter, to the wild grasses their glancing green, or it fell upon the arid waste of the desert, here wind scourged into furrows, here swept into desolate cairns, here sprinkled with stunted dark green jungle trees. It lit up the smooth gilt mosque, the frail pink and white card houses of the southern village, and the long-breasted, white-haired women who knelt in the river bed beating wrinkled clods upon stones. Steamers thudding slowly over the sea were caught in the level stare of the sun, and it beat through the yellow awnings upon passengers who dozed or paced the deck, shading their eyes to look for the land, while day after day, compressed in its oily throbbing sides, the ship bore them on monotonously over the waters, 